Welcome to the June 6th Northampton City Council meeting. Um, I am Gina Louise Shara and I will be presiding this evening. I'm going to announce that we are being audio and video recorded. Uh, we're going to start this evening with public comment as we do every council meeting. Um, we're going to start with the sign up sheet, but anyone who did not sign up it will be asked if they would like to comment after we make it through this sheet. Uh, when you come up, please state your name and you need to state your city or town that you're from for our record. Um, we always encourage brevity, but you have three minutes. Uh, after three minutes, I will ask you to wrap up. Um, that is to ensure that everyone has equal time and access. Um, and also another thing about our public comment is that we do not respond. So we, we do listen, but we do not respond to you. So don't be surprised when that happens. So I'm going to start with the first person on the sign-up sheet, which is Myrna Maloney Flynn, please. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Myrna Maloney Flynn. I'm a resident of Northampton. The so-called ROW Act is an acronym that stands for Remove Obstacles and Expand Access to Abortion. Here are some of the bill's provisions. It eliminates parental consent. It eliminates the requirement that abortions after 13 weeks be performed in hospitals. It allows abortions after 24 weeks. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, children born at 24 weeks have a survival rate of more than 50%. That number jumps to 72% at 25 weeks. The Roe Act removes life-saving medical equipment from rooms where abortions are performed, denying care for infants who survive abortion attempts. Yesterday, results of a poll were released. The poll was done by the Terrence Group on behalf of the Susan B. Anthony List. The poll surveyed Massachusetts voters of all party affiliations. 60% of the respondents were pro-choice, 40% were pro-life. Results show an overwhelming opposition to the provisions in the Roe Act. 62% oppose more late-term abortions. And by the way, the Guttmacher Institute, which is essentially the research arm of Planned Parenthood, has admitted that, quote, data suggests that most women seeking later terminations are not doing so for fetal anomaly or life endangerment. Back to the poll, 74% think late-term abortions should be performed in hospitals. 62% think parents should provide consent. Counselors, your constituents have spoken. I urge you to listen. The Roe Act is not what they want. They don't want their teenage daughters irresponsibly targeted. Voters don't consider hospitals obstacles to remove resuscitative equipment that would aid viable infants who survive abortion attempts, those who are the youngest citizens in your care, is to go against the wishes of your neighbors. And counselors, if you support this bill, you are asking your neighbors to help pay for each of these provisions. How will you defend yourself when you run into them at the grocery store or when you drop your children off at school? More importantly, what words could you possibly find to use with your own children or grandchildren when they someday ask you about the law you would have helped to pass? Question who wins here? Women and girls are less safe. Infants are unprotected. I suggest you follow the money. Where will women go if not to a hospital for a late-term abortion? I learned about tonight's meeting from a social media post promoted by Planned Parenthood. Martin Luther King once said, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe. That's three minutes. I'll ask you to finish your sentence. Nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because his conscience tells him it is right. Don't vote for something your conscience will not withstand. Don't vote for the Roe Act by your bravery, your leadership, your demonstrated commitment to <clears throat> and genuine care for the people who put you in office, you will, as Dr. King championed, do what is right.
Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kate. Is it Rudolph or is that a B? Kate You'll Butel. Kate Butel, please. Thank you. So my residence is Greenfield, but I work in East Hampton for Mass Audubon, and I'm here to speak in favor of open space and the Pine Grove Golf Course application. Um, the conservation and restoration of the Pine Grove Golf Course is an exciting uh, project for Mass Audubon to work with in partnership with the city of Northampton. It's a classic um, confluence of biodiversity protection climate change adaptation by extending and strengthening the current Rocky Hill Greenway and providing an unusual opportunity to reforest a substantial portion of a small degraded watershed. Um, as you may or may not know, over the past few years, we've had a great partnership with Northampton and we've done several transactions, little pieces of a pie building the Rocky Hill Greenway an approximately 115 acre conservation area west of Route 10 in the southern section of Northampton. This greenway is part of an impressive conservation land network extending from Holyoke and East Hampton through Northampton to Williamsburg and the Berkshire Highlands beyond. It's in, the greenway has an important role in the regional conservation network and it's been resting on the undeveloped condition of the Pine Grove Golf Course and the unprotected but undeveloped forest to the west and northwest. So protection of this property, we feel, will be a valuable safeguard to ensure the continued function of this regionally important wildlife corridor. It also contains the Nashawanic Brook, which is a small tributary to the Manhan River with headwaters in and around the Pine Grove Golf Course. The golf course um, comprises approximately one third of the Brooks 294 acre watershed. And it's pretty clear that the golf course, golf course degrades the natural function of that brook. So it's because that brook also goes, flows through the western portion of Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, it's, um, a big, it's an important piece of the whole restoration effort of the, of the Pine Grove Golf Course. So we feel in conclusion that the conservation of the Pine Grove Golf Course opens the door to a valuable restoration opportunity. It, the reestablishment of a natural stream channel and floodplain, riparian wetland creation, dam removal, and reforestation of the majority of course acres would dramatically improve water quality and hydrological issues in the Ashawanic Brook. And I might also add that the way this deal is structured, there will be retained house lots, which so there will be some tax base that's left with the city of Northampton. And those kinds of house lots that are next to open space tend to have a high value. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Karen Hidalgo. Hi, my name is Karen Hidalgo. I live at 133 Barrett Street in Northampton. I have two children who attend the Jackson Street School in grades three and five, and I'm a school counselor, also known as a guidance counselor in Northampton High School. Sorry I wasn't able to make it last night. Um, I am guessing and hoping that you all believe in the importance of public education. I'll talk to you for a minute about how public education became important to me, and then I'll tell you how I see the current situation and what I want you to do about it. When I was 16 years old, I moved into a foster home. I lived there until I went to college. Suddenly, no one adult was responsible for me. My foster parents sort of were, but not really. The seven social workers assigned to me during the two years um, sort of were, but not really. But when it came down to it, I was completely reliant on the state and its institutions for my food, my clothes, my medical care, and my well-being. I attended public schools during this time, as I always had. All this reliance on public institutions made me think deeply about their role in our society and how, for democracy to function really well, we have to take care of each other. This, in part, led me to my profession and to my advocacy for education. At this point in history in this country, public education is under assault. I understand the budget, the city budget, enough to understand that state funding is inadequate and that Northampton, in some ways, is more impacted than some other communities. I understand the issues with the methodology of charter school funding. I can assure you that I'm a passionate advocate for fixing this problem. 
No one follows my Facebook posts anymore except for my parents because everyone is tired of hearing about charter school funding. My mother wants more pictures of the grandchildren and less on charter schools. I've learned that I can clear a room by bringing up how with our state's charter school funding methodology I'm being taxed without representation. I elect my school committee representatives who have no oversight over these privately managed charter schools. So I get it. There's a lot of work for us to do together about the broader funding issues. However, right now the city of Northampton has the opportunity to right a wrong. While the city's resources are not unlimited, the city is in good fiscal health and does many amazing and wonderful things with my tax dollars. I'm pretty much in favor of all of them, but I say pay our school staff fairly first. As you know, we have school employees <coughs> earning less than minimum wage. We have a discrepancy between the pay scales of the city side clerical and custodial compared with the school side, and many of our Unit A staff have seen their paychecks go down every year for the last 10 years. It isn't fair, it's bad for morale, and it contributes to staff turnover that hurts our city's children. Failing to address this problem now is giving in to the assault against public education. We are all in this room on the front lines in this fight. I'm asking the mayor to request an increase in the budget to meet NACE's last proposal. City Council, I'm asking you to approve that. School committee, who I know are not here, I will ask you to please make a fair offer of wages that is not tied to contract language that is disrespectful to us and to our work. And to everyone else, I want you to support us by standing out before and after school, contact your school committee representation and the mayor, and tell them to settle our contract now. Thank you. His next name is, I think it's maybe Dale Marie or, Got it. yeah, okay. I can't read your last name, so please tell it to us. And It's a real easy one. It's Bro. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Dale Marie Bro, and I live in Agawam, uh, Massachusetts, and I'm here to speak in opposition of the Roe Act. Um, currently, there are 10 existing laws that are there to protect women who are getting an abortion that the Roe Act is looking to remove. Um, one being, of course, that you've already heard about, um, late-term abortions outside of a hospital. Um, no reporting of any information. So in 10 years, we won't even have the ability to look back and say, what's the impact of our decisions? because they're taking the reporting away. So we can't say <coughs> last year there were 18,000 abortions in the state of Massachusetts. We're already failing women by the current system because whatever system we have in place right now isn't working when we have 18,000 women going through a life-altering decision of abortion. But to expand that to a point where now a minor who can't go on a field trip without a parent's consent, right, it's, it's, not, it's not legal for them to be able to go and make a decision without some type of consent where an adult is involved. And when they do go before a judge, my understanding it's done off chambers, it's done in a very soft environment for them just to, you know, be understood that they're able to make a decision like that. We're getting rid of the requirements of reporting, we're failing women already as it is. I'm sure if we go back to the beginning of Roe when abortion was approved, they would have never thought in a million years that 18,000 abortions would happen in the state of Massachusetts in a year, right? So at this point when they say late-term abortion, we're just going to open the door wide open. It's going to be between a, a, a doctor and the, the woman, right? But you're taking the doctor out of the law, right? Oh, but it doesn't matter. The doctor will be included, right? We can't assume anything when we've gone this far down the spectrum. So I'm asking you to really take a look at the 10 laws that are being removed, one being a Healthy Start program that they're directing money for people who are actually deciding to have their children, right? This is a program that people are saying, I'm going to have this child. They want to direct that money into the abortion system because the two and a half million dollars that our state pays already to Planned Parenthood to the five locations already isn't enough. There's 260 loca other locations that get no funding from us. We need to stop just failing women. We're smart. We can do better than this. You know, we can do better. Whatever system we're all pushing up against, it's just not working. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not here to say take Roe away. 
I'm saying take the Roe bill in Massachusetts away. It goes too far. When you take laws off the books that protect women who are getting an abortion, that's when we go too far. We take away all the reporting. You're going too far. And I thank you so much for your time. I really do. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Benjamin K. Ald, I think. Thank you very much for having us. Appreciate it. Could you state uh, <coughs> your name I'm, again? I'm just about to read it all. My name is Benjamin Kenneth Ald. I'm 43 from Aguam, but live in Westside. I'm a member of St. John the Evangelist Church on Main Street in Aguam. I just found out about this meeting hours ago. I'm disabled. I'm 100% against the Roe Act. I am pro-life. I will read now. Hi, Judy. I am going to read what I typed out of the brain when you asked me to speak as a member against this bill. I am a dad, in quote. I am a witness to this. I looked for my Rachel's Vineyard notes, but I couldn't find them. So my talking points are, I'm a dad but I state, no, not me. I suffered in silence in my younger years, knowing I was always wanting kids, but I wanted to do better than my dad. But dad, no, not me. I had the broken heart, but didn't truly know how it bad, it hurt. It hurt to a live in, live in, I lived in forced silence until it was over. At the time, at the age, I made excuses as to why it was okay or not okay. I just had been part of buying a house and crazy work schedule and life issues at the time. Rachel's Vineyard was my saving grace, the coping forgiveness and the healing through God's word and all the love seeping through the cracks. My name that I named the child was Augustine. I named my child Augustine, but, but true meaning t to forgiveness. I chose St. Augustine because I had made my confirmation of the Catholic Church. I chose him because he was my patron saint and he had a past and so I did as well. And my past was being part of an abortion. I had no control. Naming my trial gave me huge peace. I name Augustine for a reason. If it's a girl, Augustine. I'll always have love for the mom of my child, but we killed our child so that I say, Dad, no, not me. No more, now more than ever, Dad, no, not me, still 43-year-olds, no kids. The fast-tracking infanticide bill has triggered a taking it personal mentality from me. I always wanted a child, but Dad, no, not me. Bill S-1209 kills a child so no man can be a dad and will have to live with, Dad, no, not me. So much more now than ever before the details put forth about the true the truth and the trueness of the bill are so barbaric and terroristic. No matter what the circumstances, no human being has the right to kill another human being. No human being can kill another human being. Well, I did, and it hurt for a while, but then the love and forgiveness of Jesus was my ultimate savior. I always felt like I didn't try hard enough or talk to her hard enough about talking her out of it. She had made up her mind 100%. And as I heard on Sunday at the, at the March of Life, a chant by the I thank you for your time. It doesn't matter what else is right. On here, I'm a totally opposed to that act. Please thank feel you, the Mr. same. Thank you, Mr. Ald. Lindsay Sabadosa. Thank you very much for introducing this resolution, Councillor Shiara and Councillor Klein, and I know that, or I hope that we have the support of many council members. I was happy to share with my colleagues that this resolution had been introduced tonight, and they are hopeful that this will be the first of many across the state of Massachusetts. Because one of the things that I do agree with previous speakers is that we are failing people who are pregnant, and we are failing them because we are not fully protecting them. It is abominable that our health care system is still inaccessible for many, unaffordable for many. It is abominable that women have to travel to other states in order to deal with pregnancies where there are severe fetal abnormalities. That is atrocious, that Massachusetts residents need to travel to New Mexico, to Washington, D.C., to Maryland, to deal with something that they should be able to take care of at home in a hospital. I have 
made it very clear to lots of people during my campaign, I've long worked with the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts, and I've done intake. So I've had the privilege of actually hearing what these stories are. I have been able to hear people in this city call and talk about how they have had to make a, ch make a choice between putting off a procedure that they need and paying rent asking how they're going to make car payments and afford a procedure. The ROW Act is aimed at helping the most vulnerable. We should not have children who are pregnant and wish to terminate go into a judge's chamber so a judge can decide, are you mature enough to have an abortion or have a child? What kind of choice is that? That's hurting our most vulnerable, and we know, because we do have statistics, because we do report this information, that those are often the poorest people in our communities. These are often people of color in our communities. These are not, this is not the made for TV movie where we're talking about um, some teenage girl who gets pregnant and doesn't know what to do. That's a myth. These are often people who already have children, who can't afford to have more. The Roe Act expands protections. And as we see those protections rolled back across the country, Massachusetts needs to do better, and we need to stand up. So I thank you for introducing this, and I am hopeful that I can go back to my colleagues and tell them that Northampton was first, and we were the first of many to actually protect access. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, though, perhaps 237 Riverside Drive. Uh, Laura Britton. Hi there. Uh, my name is Laura Britton. I live at 35 Ridgewood Terrace in East Hampton. I stand here to speak in support of the Roe Act, and I thank Councilors Klein and Sciara for introducing this resolution. I stand here not only as the legislative aide to Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, and I'm going to echo a lot of those remarks. Um, I am also an intake volunteer for the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts and have been for about a year. For those who don't know the fund, our mission is to provide direct financial assistance to those seeking abortions who cannot afford them. In short, we help people afford health care because that's what abortion is. Those in need of financial assistance for this procedure call the fund cell phone. Intake volunteers take basic information determine how much funding can be provided, and call a pledge into whichever clinic is seeing the patient. A month ago on May 7th, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed a so-called fetal heartbeat bill. The next day, I called in a pledge to an Atlanta, Georgia clinic, which helped a caller afford abortion care. That same week, the fund helped roughly five people in Massachusetts afford abortion care. Massachusetts has no fetal heartbeat bill, we have a democratic legislature and a reputation for liberal leanings. Yet we still have people struggling to afford abortion care in our state, in our communities, in this city. Oftentimes it's people who are not eligible for mass health or of high deductibles. It's our undocumented community. It's young people in abusive households or those in abusive relationships. It's our most vulnerable populations. Some people may feel that Roe is unnecessary in Massachusetts or goes a little too far. I'm here to tell you that I have spoken directly to people in this state who cannot afford abortion care, who cannot afford to travel outside of Massachusetts to, re to receive abortion care, who cannot ask their parents or, or guardians for permission to receive abortion care, or who cannot stand in front of a judge and prove they're mature enough to receive abortion care. Massachusetts needs Roe. No, we're not Georgia or Alabama or Kentucky or Missouri. We don't have a six week or eight week outright ban but what good is having legal abortion in Massachusetts if it's inaccessible? Massachusetts needs Roe not just now, but for the future. Please put the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts out of business. Support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Mayori. Rachel Mayori leads Massachusetts. Uh, good evening. I'm the director of the Pioneer Valley Women's March, and I just came here to say thank you. And because I want to say thank you, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I want to say thank you to Councilors Klein and Councilor Chiara um, for drafting this resolution, the resolution affirming support for access to safe and legal abortions. A big thanks to Rep. Um, Sabadosa um, and Warren, Markey, 
Joe Comerford, all those working tirelessly to safeguard reproductive health care across our state. When I approached my city ward counselor, Elisa Klein, about what could be done at the municipal level to safeguard women's basic access to health care, I was feeling intrinsically what Planned Parenthood hero Shanique Spaulding has characterized as putting our oxygen masks on first so that we can help others across the state and across the country. Local initiatives like this matter. They can be a model for change, the change that we want to see at a state and a federal level. They act as a template and it, they're an important work of, of advocacy. I just want you to know how I personally, how deeply comforted and moved I am to see you confirming the bodily integrity and basic human rights of over half of Northampton as well as across the country. Thank you so much. Um, Shanique Spaulding. Good evening. My name again is Shanique Spaulding, and I am from the city of Springfield, but I currently work for Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund um, in Massachusetts. I'm the Western and Central Mass organizer here in Western Mass. Um, I am an immigrant to this country. I am also um, a proud supporter of Planned Parenthood before my work. I've worked for the YWCA of Western Mass in sexual assault and domestic violence care, and I'm also a proud Catholic. But I'm here to say thank you to um, Councillor Klein and Councillor Sierra for presenting the Roe Act. Right now, we are advocating, and many women and many organizations across the state is advocating for the Roe Act here in Massachusetts. And that's because abortion is health care, plain and simple. In times, our laws, it is time that our laws reflect the state's commitment to reproductive freedom and health care access. Abortion should not be singled out by politicians trying to impose their personal ideologies on others. I've sat here today and heard some falsehoods and false representations of what's in the Roe Act bill. And I believe that those falsehoods is one step towards outlawing abortion care. Let me be clear, the Roe Act seeks to do four things. One of it is to address and remove the, um, the parental consent law. Here in Massachusetts, anyone under the age of 18 cannot access abortion care without parental consent. If they are unable to receive parental consent, they will then need to achieve getting an attorney and then speaking to a judge to explain why they cannot get parental consent. A judge will then decide whether or not they are in, um, mature enough to make the decision on their own to have a abortion. If they choose that they are not mature to do that, they will then automatically say that they are now mature to be parents. We are one of 17 states that provide abortion care that have parental consent laws. Just over our border, just south of Massachusetts, Connecticut does not have parental consent laws. And in regards to the 24 weeks law, we hope to remove the 24 weeks law in the case of fatal fetal anomalies. These are for individuals who have most likely decided to carry their pregnancy to terms and have at 24 weeks received emotional news. And I, I get a little choked up because I know individuals personally who have had this happen to them at 24 weeks. And that simply means that at 24 weeks they've gotten a diagnosis that said that the child or the fetus may not be able to survive outside of the womb, that there is a danger to themselves or to the child that they're carrying, and they have to then make a decision. If they choose to have an abortion, it means that they only have the option of traveling to two states, which is Colorado and New Mexico, to receive that care. And believe it or not, that is Massachusetts, the place that has been a pioneer in a great many topics, including health care. Thank you so much. I hope that you will really consider uh, passing this piece of legislation today. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Kristen El Elge? El Hello, my name is Kristen Eldy. I'm a resident of 41 Chestnut Avenue in Leeds. 
Um, thank you for giving me the chance to speak today on this very, on the very important topic of the Roe Act, which I uh, fully stand behind and hope gets passed. Um, I, in short, I support the safe expanded access to abortion for Massachusetts residents. I believe the right to abortion is the right to bodily autonomy, which all humans deserve by nature of their humanity. Women and all people who have the capacity to get pregnant are humans, and all humans deserve adequate health care, including access to safe abortion without undue restrictions that, as others have pointed out, do target, um, particularly target the most vulnerable among us. And truly the only safe abortion is legal abortion. Of course abortion will happen, and it will happen regardless of whether it's legal or how specifically it's legal. So let's please do the right and humane thing and make sure this fundamental human right is preserved and expanded for the sake of all people's full humanity and safe existence. Thank you. That is everyone who has signed up. Um, but anyone else who would like to speak, uh, may I just please raise your hand and I'll start to call right here in the front. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Jennifer McKenna. I live up in Leeds. Um, but I work with a network of law and policy centers um, working for reproductive justice, economic justice, and safety from gender-based violence in other states. And I wanted to reinforce what Lauren said about, uh, from my vantage working in other states, um, to correct the misperception. A lot of my um, folks I know in Massachusetts who are pro-choice and progressive think that Massachusetts is in the vanguard of policymaking around reproductive rights. And we are not. We have strong case law and judicial rulings. Um, and we still have medically unnecessary laws on our books that delay and deny abortion care. Um, we force pregnant people to travel, as has been acknowledged here, um, to get to other states to get the care they need. We've taken significant steps in recent years to strengthen our state laws, including getting antiquated abortion laws, some from the 1800s, off the books just last year. Um, but we're still behind other states, California, Washington, Oregon, New York, and Vermont, to name a few, who are doing everything they can to ensure that their state laws protect comprehensive access and coverage for abortion care for all who need it. We are not there yet. Passing the Roe Act is a critical step in getting there. Um, and it's never been more urgent, as we know, given what's happening from the federal level and in other states. Um, I want to address really quickly the parental consent um, and the notification um, provision and the 24-week ban provision. Um, in an ideal world, every teenager would have a parent or guardian to guide uh, him or her, her and to make that decision. Um, but the reality is um, some young people don't have that safe support. Um, in Massachusetts, the, minor the majority of minors who do get an abortion do it with parental consent. So the parental consent uh, a notification requirement targets the teens who are at most at risk, who can't tell a parent or guardian, um, and including many in the foster care system. The current requirement does nothing to make it safe for teens at, who are at risk to talk to a parent or guardian. It sends them, most of them, many of them, to New York or Vermont or a place where they can get the abortion that they need, or before a judge who, as it's been noted, will determine whether they're mature enough to have an abortion and the irony is not lost on you that if you're not mature enough to have an abortion, how are you mature enough to give birth and raise and support and raise a child? The 24-week ban, um, I, I, the, those experiences, those situations are tragic. They're a very, very, very small minority of the abortion cases that happen in this state and around the country or at 24 weeks or later. And when you get an amnio, you can't get an amnio until you're 21 weeks. Um, you may not know that you have a fetal, fatal, a fatal, fetal abnormality in, 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 before you have a chance to make a decision. Um, I, I, last thing I would say is anti-abortion opponents are misrepresenting efforts to protect access to abortion care using deceptive and insulting language to manipulate public opinion. I, I urge you not to be swayed by that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I'll, I'll just go in order of what I see. So uh, in the front row. Um, hello, I'm Lucia Dostal, and I'm from 61 Fox Farms Road in Northampton. Um, 
and I would like to speak about the city's budget. I'm a student of Northampton High School, and I personally am being affected by the underpayment of our teachers. Right now, Northampton High School is under work to rule. Our teachers who have dedicated uh, hours um, to their school um, are, yeah, okay. Work to rule is um, teachers working strictly by the contract, 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Not only does this limit our education as students, but it also affects our futures. Without after-school clubs, teachers' letters of recommendation for college, and after-school help, Northampton's, Northampton High's grades um, is going, could possibly dramatically decrease. I know personally for me, without all of the after-school help from especially like my teachers in science classes, like physics, um, would be significantly worse. Whether this funding comes from uh, the state, Smith College maybe, or charter schools, um, as a student and a part of our future, I believe that this raise is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should note, and I should have noted it before, that we still have an open budget hearing, so we will be uh, a little bit later. It's totally fine. Um, we will be addressing the budget later, and people will have an opportunity to speak during that. So you can make a choice to speak during public comment, which is totally fine, um, or wait for that budget hearing. I just should have said that. Um, who else would like to speak now? Okay, I'm gonna move over to the gentleman in the rust-colored shirt, I'm gonna say. Thank you very much. I'm Elliot Levine from Haydenville. Uh, I'm on the board of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts, and I'm speaking in favor of this resolution. Thank you so much for considering it. Uh, the Trump-Pence administration has launched a full-scale attack on our freedoms and our rights, including access to abortion. Even in Massachusetts, people face unjust barriers to safe legal abortion. With the U.S. Supreme Court poised to gut Roe v. Wade, Massachusetts must dismantle barriers to care and reform state laws so every person has the right to pursue the life they want, including the right to decide if and when to become a parent without politicians interfering. Abortion is health care and health care is a fundamental right. That's why the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts, I assume the hundreds of donors who send us over $100,000 a year to help hundreds of women, um, also I'm assuming stand behind this, so thank you so much for considering it. Thank you. In the back, in the black shirt, or dress, I can't tell. Hi, my name is Tara Orzelek, and I live in Northampton. Um, and I stand here in support of the Roe Act and the resolution affirming Northampton's support of the Roe Act. I am speaking today as a citizen of Northampton, a woman, and a mother of two near teenage daughters. My daughters are fortunate. They are being raised in a stable household that encourages honesty and openness. There is no stigma regarding sex or comfort contraception. If they were confronted with an unintended pregnancy while minors, they would not hesitate to turn to me for help and guidance, including a discussion regarding the decision to have an abortion. However, I also recognize we are, they are fortunate, because although we live in a blue state and a progressive city, there are undoubtedly teenagers, even in Northampton, who live in households that are not socially or economically stable. Teenagers who live in households where talk about sex, contraception and abortion is discouraged, if not forbidden. Teenagers who may face severe anger, including emotional and physical abuse if their parents knew they were sexually active, let alone pregnant. Teenagers who have absent parents or parents so challenged by their own life that they may not be able to offer any help, including consent at all. These young women are the ones affected by the required parental consent. These are the young women who may do harm to themselves when confronted with a desperation of their situation and the realization that they have zero control of their bodies and accordingly their future. These are the young women who might turn like a friend of mine to punching themselves in the stomach repeatedly, day after day, to the point of injury, to force a spontaneous abortion miscarriage after being raped by an acquaintance. Opponents to the Roe Act claim it would harm our teenage girls. Clearly, restricting access and requiring consent would produce the most harm. Opponents to the Roe Act beseech us to protect life. 
To me, the Roe Act will protect those teenage girls most vulnerable, which I would argue, given their age and their gender, is the majority of teenage girls. It will protect their future, their ability to determine their own destiny, their ability to become strong women, influential leaders, and caring, loving mothers, if and when they choose to have children. As a community, let's lead our state and our country into protecting health care for all, which includes reproductive freedom for all. Please support this resolution. Thank you. Hands, any other hands? Oh, in the green. Okay. It's just three minutes though, even if you're together, got it? Perfect, All right. <laughs> we got it. Here we go. So hi everyone, my name is Kamini Waldman. And I'm Megan Condon. We are both first years at Northampton High School and in total support of the Row Act. We are both women, and we are here to say to you that we know that these are our bodies, and with our bodies come our choices. Only we have the right to decide what we want to do with them. It is only a woman's choice to decide whether they want to or if they want to have a child at any point in their life. We would like to say and we know that it already has been said, but we feel that it is incredibly important. The Planned Parenthood website states that the Trump-Pence administration has launched a full-scale attack on our freedoms and our rights, including access to abortion. We know that as high school students, we want to know, moving forward in the world, that our bodies will remain under our control. We want to be able to tell people that our Northampton City Council voted in support of the Roe Act and without a doubt is supportive to safe access to abortions for all women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Sherilyn? <laughs> well, guess I don't need to say my name. Please do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Sherilyn Stritter uh, at 209 Glendale Road. And I'm uh, here to speak in favor of the resolution that uh, you've thankfully put forward tonight, um, not just as a resident of Northampton, but as a young person who would be impacted by the Roe Act. Um, because of the provisions um, that has been uh, noted quite a bit tonight, um, the first provision is um, that the parental consent uh, limitation that's currently on the books would be uh, taken away. And so that would be very helpful because just a few months ago, I was 17. And if something were to have happened and I would have gotten pregnant, I would have been able to for sure get an abortion without any uh, mishaps, well, if I were to be able to get funding. That's a whole nother story. Um, but um, one other thing I'd like to note is that um, Safe abortion is also legal abortion. Um, and the provisions in the Roe Act would um, improve upon the rights outlined in Roe v. Wade, um, because before Roe, abortion happened, but with staggering health deficits. And so what this act would do is allow us to say in Massachusetts, we don't want uh, those uh, health deficits to continue to happen, but we want to protect the people who live in our commonwealth. So I thank you for your time, and I hope that you will all uh, support uh, the resolution tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Foster. I live at 155 Grove Street in Northampton. And everybody, or this, many of the voices I've heard recently have spoken very, very eloquently about the protections and the reasons for the Roe Act. And I just wanted to only, um, add my voice in support to thank Councillor Shara, Councillor Klein. And also, we, we have an amazing representative, uh, Representative Sabadosa, working on our behalf to ensure that health care protections for women um, remain in place in Massachusetts. And I would love to make sure that when she goes back to the State House, she has the support of the Northampton City Council. So thank you for introducing that, and um, I hope you support it. Any other hands out there? Oh, yes, please. Hi, 
everybody, my name is Grace Ramsey. I live on South Street in Northampton and I'm here to speak in support of the ROW Act. I'm also the health services manager at Tapestry in Greenfield in Franklin County. Um, but I'm also here to support this on behalf of Tapestry. Um, Cheryl Zoll gives her full support as well. Um, we do see teenagers who need to go and receive an abortion. We see 17 year olds. We see these women. Um, we go through options counseling with them, and the quality of health care that we can give to them is severely affected. They can't go to certain clinics. We have to edit the health care that we're giving them and the referrals that we can give them. Um, to be clear, we're a Title X funded organization. We don't provide termination services, but we do provide um, access to referrals and other services. And during this time, um, I just want to, again, voice how critical it is to support reproductive health care in the state um, and in our city. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody left who would like to speak at public comment this evening? I'm sorry, there's only one chance. I just didn't state my address. Oh, um, I, I think you said your, your city, which is yeah, Agle. Okay, we have, thank you for that. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, anyone left, no? Okay, in that case, we are going to start the meeting. Um, Laura, when you are ready, please take the roll. Here. Present. Here. Bradslick. Here. 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 Okay. So uh, we have two public hearings. We're going to take them in. Um, we're going to flip the order on them because Lisa has been waiting very patiently. Um, so our first one, I'm going to read it and then I'll ask for a motion to open it, um, is <clears throat> public hearing um, on for 19.043 uh, National Grid, Verizon New England, full petition for Burt's Pit Road, petition number 27859494. In accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the General Laws, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, June 6, uh, 2019, at 7.05 p.m., or a little bit late, um, in the City Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, on the petition of National Grid, Verizon, New England, to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. Um, and I don't need to read this other part, right? No. I'm, I'm motion that we open the public hearing. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of opening the public hearing? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, says the proponent. Thank you. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. I'm here just to requesting it's a mid-span pole essentially. We have a section of wire that's that's pretty low and it's in the uh, section of Burt's Pit Road. If you just take a right off of Florence Road, it's pretty close to that intersection where it's low and we just want to correct it. We are aware that there is a gas main in that area. All the poles and the gas main happen to run down along the same side. And um, I have spoken with the DPW about the location as well. Like we have a um, we have a memo from the DPW mm -hmm. saying that they approve that petition. Um, are there any other proponents for this poll petition? No. Uh, any opponents to this? Also, no. Councilors. I move to close public hearing. Second it. Okay. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. 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 The hearing is closed. Can I give a note? Yes, I accidentally neglected to put um, action to approve the National Grid Verizon and the Poll Petition for Burt's Pit Road on the consent agenda. So if somebody would be willing to offer approval of that petition or motion. Second. When we get to that, at around quarter of 11, uh, I'll offer that. <laughs> um, hold on a second. second. Sorry, ma'am. Can you speak louder, please? Yeah, I can't hear anything. Apologies. It's very difficult to hear with that microphone. Okay. We do, yeah, it, we do have um, hearing devices if that would be helpful. Oh, I think <laughs> maybe. Uh, <laughs> he made an adjustment, yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think he had it on Thank too. Thank you. Low. And it's our road and, you know, the polls go next door yeah. to the property, so I'm very interested in hearing. 
uh, Laura, could you repeat what you were just saying? Oh, just that um, I'd left, there, we, there's gonna be action to approve the poll petition on Burt's Pit Road on the consent agenda, and I had left it off, so I was asking if one of the councilors would just please make that as a separate motion, approving the petition. Did you understand? I, I mean, I'm just talking to you about it as well. And if you'd like, if you'd like me to go over that with you, I'm not going to speak about that, where it's going. No, I just want to know what's going on. I'd like to hear it. Yes. So, so my original, my original request was for the poll to be, it's a mid-span poll. It's coming in off of, off of Florence Road, on Bird's Pit Road. There's a section that's pretty low, and we need to get those up. It's, uh, it's probably about 10 or 15 feet. I'm sorry, I don't have a house number. But to the right of the uh, house, uh, to a driveway, it's in kind of a wooded area. And it's going to be in line with the other poles. It'll just help bring those wires that are low up a little bit higher. You're not planning to take down any trees, are you? No. Actually, if there, were, if there was any trimming that needed to be done, it would already need to be done because they, you know, what they do is they clear for the lines, not necessarily the poles. And this is going right under the existing lines. We're not installing new ones. We've already closed the hearing, Counselor. Um, where were we? I can't recall. <laughs> so we, we closed oh, the right, hearing. So I offered you to made uh, submit the action into uh, <clears throat> the consent agenda, which will, as I said, come around quarter of 11. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, I would also add that Lisa is available if you have any. She can, she can even do a site review with you if you want. And, and she, to discuss the, the poll location and what the work order is going to be. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we're going to go back to our other public hearing. So we are reconvening the public hearing that we um, had yesterday. And this is, so we're continuing our hearing on the, um, the FY20, the fiscal year 2020 budget. In accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7 for action on the operating budget and by order of the City Council, public hearing will be held to consider the proposed FY 2020 budget commencing on June 5th, 2019, at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers and continuing on June 6th, at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers. The Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Um, so we are already in an open hearing. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on the budget? Please come up. Um, we can see if the mayor would be able to entertain questions. Can you guys, I can please. And I have two points I want to make. The first one is in support of the um, studies to look at fiber optics to the homes. I, not only, you've heard all the stuff about we all want cheaper, faster, but it also meshes with another project the city is working on, and that is to reduce our carbon emissions. By having fiber to the home, that allows us to make use of smart meters to people's homes and thereby affect when people are using their power and reduce the peak loads, which are the dirtiest and most expensive loads. So it has a dual purpose that matches two different things the city is working on. The other point I want to make is to just to thank you to the mayor and the chief financial officer for the stellar job they have done at explaining over and over again what has gone into this budget, the listening they have done. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I know, so you're interested in asking some questions? So, so come up to the podium. Um, I should have said, so you know, we had a hearing yesterday, and so the, the five department heads of the five largest departments presented and then um, we're now continuing that but so please um, go ahead and say what you'd like to say and then we'll we'll see what do we I actually say my name yes please. I'm Hannah Harper and I live in Northampton I go to NHS and I have a question for the mayor um, do you think it is unreasonable to say in order to give public school teachers a raise Smith College and um, and the state could provide our town with more funding if not where could the funding increase um, where could the funding to increase public schools teachers' wages come from? 
Mayor Narkowitz? Sure. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, do you want me to? Usually I address the chair. Anyway. Okay, I have to address the chair. But I'm trying to answer your question, but I'm supposed to address the chair. So, um, it's a little odd, but that's the way we do it here. Um, so that's a great question, and obviously um, those of you who've been following uh, local government know that I am a uh, regular testifier um, in Boston before the legislature um, as a member of the Local Government Advisory Commission, which is a, a, a board appointed of local government officials that work to advance the needs of cities and towns. Um, we've been lobbying for several pieces of legislation to reform uh, not only the way we uh, fund our schools, uh, but also specifically the way the charter school uh, systems are funded. Um, there has not been much action in the current budget process, um, but there's legislation pending um, that is looking to do that. I'll uh, believe it when I see it. I still um, trust but verify. I, I'm, I, it's going to involve new revenue. Um, that's what we all know. We know that we need additional revenue to fund um, public education adequately in Massachusetts. Um, and so far, I have not seen a lot of um, a lot of appetite for adding new revenue. So that'll be the key. Um, in terms of the pilot issue, um, some of you may remember um, a couple of years ago, I led a pretty extensive public process around payment in lieu of taxes. I made a major proposal. I brought a resolution to the city council, which it endorsed fully. I held a series of town hall meetings all around the city. I created a pilot program, um, which was modeled after Boston's pilot program, uh, which was asking our largest tax-exempt uh, landowners or property owners uh, to contribute 25% of what they would pay um, in real estate taxes if they were a taxable uh, entity. Um, it was a voluntary program. Um, and we did do outreach to our largest uh, tax-exempt taxpayers, um, and they chose not to participate in the program. Um, they made some um, uh, modest voluntary contributions, um, which we've used to fund, including fund some items in our schools, as well as our public safety. Um, but at this point, there's no, I have no lawful authority to force any tax-exempt entity uh, to um, pay taxes. Um, so that's sort of the two challenges that we face uh, on the state level. Um, someone mentioned quite correctly earlier that uh, Northampton, not only is, are all cities and towns impacted by some of the issues around Chapter 70 and charter tuition, um, but Northampton, and we can demonstrate this with data, uh, uh, has, seems to have an inordinate impact, um, partially because of our relation to so many charter schools around us, um, and then the way the formula calculates um, how, how much Chapter 70 we receive. As Dr. Provost uh, stated last night, um, under, almost all, under all three of the budget scenarios, the governor's budget, the house budget, and the Senate budget, um, Northampton would receive less education funding um, uh, from the state in FY 2020. Um, and so that would be my answer. Um, obviously, we want to work to make sure we can fund our schools adequately, as well as all of our city services. Um, but the challenge is, uh, without more state aid, um, that forces us to do it at the local level um, on our local tax base. So that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments on the budget? Counselors, any? Here, wait. I did want to just correct one thing. Um, not correct one thing, but I did. The other conundrum about about Smith College um, is that they are actually our largest taxpayer um, because they do t pay taxes on many of their properties. Um, so, for example, their commercial buildings they own. Um, if you go to Hungry Ghost Bread, mm -hmm. um, that's owned by Smith College. The building is owned by Smith College. So they do pay taxes on their taxable property, but obviously they have a large portion of um, property that is exempt on the central campus. So I did want to at least be fair to, to them in that regard. Um, because again, <laughs> you're only allowed to um, be exempt from taxes for things that are part of your charitable purpose. Uh, they do have lots of rental housing, commercial property, and they do pay taxes on that, so. <clears throat> Thank you, yes. Fo following up on that, um, 
<coughs> the donations that Smith makes or Cooley Dickinson Hospital, which would be two of the larger nonprofits that are not required to pay property taxes, are, as the mayor said, voluntary. And they're actually dedicated. For instance, they will get, with my taxes, I don't get to pick and choose where my taxes go. They're sent into a pool, and well, in this case, I do get to vote on the budget to some extent, so I have some privilege that some people don't have. But by and large, um, so these nonprofits, and originally they were given nonprofit status schools, hospitals, and churches because they were serving the public and they were not wealthy agencies. Well, that's changed a lot. That's changed a lot. Schools are very wealthy. Uh, this, I've often compared uh, Northampton with Rome and Vatican City. The, there was far more money at Smith than there is here in the city of Northampton, yet we provide many of the services and we also support a larger community by and large. So it's, hospitals tend to have some resources as well. Uh, some are challenged. Cooley Dickinson is now part of Mass General, not a small hospital network. But they're still exempted. They're not required to pay. And Northampton actually has a rather large portion of nonprofits. So there are a lot of what are called 501c3s or social service agencies that do not pay taxes on their properties. And this is part of the problem with actually having property tax be the source of our revenue to subsidize our schools. Because it actually falls on uh, individual homeowners or property owners many of whom are on fixed incomes, who are suffering the same issues that the teachers are describing as well. They, they're retired, they're, they're receiving social security and possibly if they're lucky, a pension, and they paid down their mortgage years ago, but their tax bills keep going up and up and up, probably larger than their mortgage in some cases. And that actually forces people to leave the community. So this is, this is a holistic problem, and it's one that we've been fighting for I don't know, ever since I first took my oath about what, calling for what we call progressive taxation, which is essentially requiring people who have the ability to pay to pay their fair share and not putting the burden, the greater burden, on the people who are less able to subsidize these things. And so unfortunately the fights happen here on the ground here in Northampton or whatever community that's trying to address these shortcomings, whereas the larger fight the larger influencer, the uh, group most culpable, sits in relative distance and relative safety from, from the same drama that we experience here on the ground. And that's very frustrating. But, I mean, so Smith has actually been very good to this city. Uh, to the, and, and and actually serves as somewhat of an anchor, as, part, as an intrinsic part of identification, but at the same time, they benefit enormously by being in Northampton, it's mutual. And it was, and it, this is true of every college town. They all wish, I mean, poor Amherst wishes that their three schools could cough up, I mean, you know, a, a portion of their billion dollar, multiple billion dollar endowments, that's not the case with Hampshire, obviously, but, um, so this is, and if wishes were horses, we all would ride, and all the teachers would be making one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. But unfortunately, we have asked, and that's all we're allowed to do is go hat in hand and say, "Would you please?" And they said, "Thanks for asking, we're not interested." So, and we'll keep asking. <coughs> Any other comments on the budget? Councilor Nash. Yeah, I, I have um, some questions for the mayor. And actually, it, it has to do with some discussions that we had um, out, outside of the hearing um, to, while I was gathering in, information. And um, I, I found it very helpful uh, that, um, that uh, the mayor shared. Could you share with council your directive to administrators, um, you know, you know, when you met with them, what your goals were, were for constructing this budget. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, so um, as part of the budget process, we obviously have the uh, formal kickoff meeting um, that happens per the charter with the City Council and the School Committee where we talk about the, some of the um, 
revenue projections and some of the other issues, state funding, et cetera. Uh, but then internally, as we work with all of our department heads, uh, we, we ask them to prepare uh, draft budgets as we begin the process. Um, and so this year, as part of that process, we asked all of our departments um, to prepare level service budgets, uh, which means basically taking the same pr the services you provided in FY 2019 and bringing them forward into FY 20, um, accounting for all uh, you know contractual obligations, uh, th things that are part of you know, collective bargaining, et cetera, um, and and then to basically uh, on the O and M side, which is the operations and maintenance side, um, to tr really try to focus on a level funded O and M um, budget, um, and so that was sort of the starting point. Um, and then we met with each individual department. Uh, we did say that if there are if there are cases where uh, there is a need for additional staff or more additional OM, um, you we want to hear about those and and we'll discuss them. Um, those were the exception, obviously, uh, throughout this process. Um, you did hear Director Lascalia talk last night about her uh, reorganization efforts um, and the need to move some staff around within her department. Um, that was an example of one where uh, we needed to make some staffing changes. Um, but that was basically the starting point um, given our, situa our fiscal situation. Um, and again, the, the larger you know, fiscal stability plan has been about maintaining level services. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the prior construct and the construct that many um, cities and towns face um, is level funding uh, their, their uh, budgets, uh, which basically means you have to start out your process by what do you have to cut um, to provide the same services in FY19 uh, uh, or basically to the same amount of money in FY19 and FY20. Um, so that's been one of the, the paradigm shifts that we've tried to do with this fiscal stability plan is to try to maintain level services. So that was the charge, um, and we met with each of our uh, city department heads. Um, we generally go through those. We collect information. We often circle back to them, um, and then uh, Finance Director Wright and I have to go through that and try to determine what we can and cannot do um, in the context of the budget. So that was the process. And in a follow-up to that, so we have a 4.4 percent increase overall in the budget. Of the 4.4 percent, what percentage of that is just meeting contractual obligations in terms of those were your directives? Um, well, on the PS, so again, on the PS side, you know, the budget is divided into PS and OM. Right. PS is personnel services. OM is you know operations and maintenance. So that would be things like you know supplies, electricity. I mean you heard uh, you heard uh, Director Pomerantz talk about those last night, um, and and they're in every department. Um, so on the PS side, uh, which is again um, uh, personnel, uh, the, the actual salaries for personnel, um, health insurance, um, uh, retirement, our mandatory re uh, contribution to the retirement board. Um, that constitutes about 93 percent of that um, of that increase that you're. Getting. <coughs> and again, I mean, it's like we're, uh, the city is an organization made up of people. Uh, you know, you, you know, firefighters, police officers, public works, parks and rec, you know, auditors, treasurers, um, and all of the staff that run these um, various departments and deliver services. So. Um, not unsurprisingly, you know, the largest portion of the budget is people. Um, so uh, the remaining uh, you know, six percent um, was in the OM side of the budget, um, and you heard about some of those things. Uh, you know, whether it's you know increases um, in the cost of supplies, increases in other um, other you know fixed costs that go up every year. So that's sort of the balance. Um, and that's always the challenge, uh, because the way we deliver services is with people. Um, that's what we are. That's what our organization is, a service organization. And it's the same on the school side. Yep. And, and I want to thank you for that, because what knowing those directives and how those were playing out were really helpful going through the budget. And, and knowing that, um, that <coughs> the mayor and, and uh, city administrators, they're not looking, you know, the, they weren't looking to increase things by 4.4 percent. They were looking to uh, have maintain services and have the most effective budget possible, and deliver the services that same services last year 
this year and that it was really just contractual obligations that largely explain to two on uh, city salaries personnel and personnel, personnel services yeah exactly right. for staff and, so um, and it's not and that's a, that's an that's the overall increase obviously there's so that ju I just want to be clear that increase isn't like you know oh we're super expanding some service over here or over there you know that that we're running pretty lean and clean uh, well that is the lean um, that's always the challenge. In, that's, that's that's the ch even just even, even just trying to provide level service budget um, under the constraints that we have, um, you know, the constraints of Proposition Two and a Half, and uh, not only being able to grow our, our levy, you know, our, our revenue by two and a half percent when other expenses are going up at a much higher rate, um, and that includes charter school costs. That includes you know a whole a whole rash of other issues. Uh, that we have to be able to work with so that is the challenge and that's the you know if you look around western mass you see that play out in communities all around western mass well i just want to thank you for all the good work around this this is it's very impressive thank you councilor Councilor thank you um mayor I'm, i just want to thank um the director of yesterday when i questioned mr pomerant in regards about a report on the savings from the landfill, the solar array from um, Glendale Road landfill, and immediately we got the report back. And I feel that this landfill PV array is extremely important. I've had many people in the city, after we closed it down, thought it was the best way to go, and I feel now I'm gonna read it off from December 2017 through April 2019, the landfill PV array produced 4,410,364 kilowatts of electricity. This generated $848 and 104 worth of net metering credits, which were used to pay Northampton electric bills. The city paid Amoresco $451,474 for these net metering credits, resulting in a net savings of $396,630 no, since the array went live. The array has produced about 3.3 to 3.4 million kilowatts of electricity every 12 months this is in line with our expectations so we're saving money there's no question about it and i think councillor bidwell you asked about the led lights you got that email maybe you could read that off because this is unbelievable do you have that email i i don't have it in front of me but uh, but i could read it please please do okay because it's amazing um, the LED streetlights, since streetlights are not metered, we cannot verify actual electricity savings. But based on the wattage levels that the lights are set at, compared to the old wattage levels, the streetlights are consuming 68% less electricity than before the project, or 590,300 kilowatts less electricity a year. So you figure that's about a third less a year that we're getting. On a cost basis, the upgrade has reduced our annual electric bill for street lights by around 70% or savings of approximately 214,000 a year. That's awesome. Thank you, Councilor. You're welcome. Thank you for highlighting those. And obviously the city's committed um, <clears throat> to not only to being um, energy conscious, um, which obviously saves tax dollars, but also promoting renewable energy. Yep. Um, and so the, the thank you for your support, particularly of the solar array, which is in your ward. Um, I know we were we held some public meetings together with your residents, and um, I think it's been a, a great reuse of that brownfield, and it's you know producing uh, renewable energy, and we've assigned those credits to schools and city buildings, which has helped them. 
uh, both the schools and the city uh, reduce its electric costs, which is, uh, you know, again, one of those major fixed cost drivers. So thank you for Thank you for your support for it, too. Councillor Bidwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, too, had a question about uh, the, the process of the preparation of the, of, of the budget. Um, I was I was struck by Dr. Provost's uh, presentation of the process that he goes through with 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 the school committee, and uh, one of the one of the interesting stops along the way, as he described it, was in February, I believe, when he presented to, <coughs> to the school committee uh, six uh, key objectives that he intended to be focused on as he developed a budget in the months ahead with his staff. Um, he called it a first peak budget, and he rolled it out to the school committee for feedback. Sort of a, this is what I'm thinking of before I go further, am I on the right track? And I was just wondered if, certainly not required by charter, but I, I wondered as a, as a city council, as, as we sometimes are very impressed with the 235 page document that lands on our desk, but we haven't had other than informally, a lot of consultation mm -hmm. uh, up until that time. I wondered if you might consider uh, in the budget preparation process in the, in the future mm -hmm. something akin to the way the superintendent works with, with the school committee, which is without getting into all sorts of specifics and nuts and bolts, just to address at a level of sort of strategic and programmatic priority. Uh, reorganizations for purposes of efficiency that perhaps mm -hmm. are being contemplated. And, and then, of course, the critical questions are, what are the key issues that need to be addressed in schools and, and, and highways and utilities? Um, and I just wondered if, uh, and again, it's not required by charter, of course, but I just wondered if you might consider that opportunity for a l little bit of back and forth with council uh, prior to the time that working with Susan Wright uh, and your department heads, the extremely detailed budget is prepared and then presented to us. Yeah, I mean, I think the, well, obviously I, I was there, I'm the chair of the school committee. Um, a little bit of a difference in that it's actually the school committee's budget. The school committee is actually adopting the budget um, and they hire a superintendent to actually help them write it. Um, so it's a little bit of a different process. I, I they're kind of the they're kind of the executive of that. I understand. Um, it is interesting. I wish Dr. Provost had mentioned last night because many of those priorities that he mentioned also come out of the district improvement plan, um, which is which is part of a document that's developed by school councils who develop individual school improvement plans, and they identify many of those key criteria, which is sort of a part of the um, you know part of the uh, education reform. So it's a little bit different, um, but uh, but. Certainly, that's something I would take under advisement. Um, uh, they obviously are starting earlier because they have to pass their budget earlier. Uh, they have to deliver it to me earlier. So uh, take it under advisement. A little bit of a different situation, a little bit of a different dynamic. I understand. It's a different different context, yeah. different yeah. set of institutional relationships. I appreciate relationships, that feedback. But, but nevertheless, it's a, it's, a, it's a group of people working together to ultimately produce the most important mm -hmm. decision that uh, as, as a body we make. Yeah. And I would just... Uh, I well, I appreciate you for taking under advisement that yes. uh, the possibility of that tweak. Maybe in your process. next term. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. I, I, I look forward to that conversation with. Oh, that's right. It won't be. Here. But um, okay. Appreciate it. For, for successors who sit here, okay. I think it would strengthen the process and the buy-in once you get there. Okay. Appreciate that. Councilor okay. Kearney. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Mayor, I've had a couple of people asking me, and I know it's not really part of our um, budget review, but um, <clears throat> we have, <coughs> excuse me, various um, stabilization plans. Tonight we have the Marijuana Stabilization Fund. Could you just, um, just speak generally, briefly, about the Fiscal Stability Fund that we have, its restrictions, its um, challenges, and possibly what your plans are for that fund in the upcoming year? So the Fiscal Stability Fund obviously is a very specific stabilization fund that we set up after the 2013 override. It was sort of a package of that override uh, where we were attempting uh, to fill a $1.4 million gap in our budget. 
um, and we ended up uh, pa uh, 1.7, excuse me, 1.7. We ended up passing a $2.5 million override, uh, but the plan was not to use all of that $2.5 million in new revenue, um, just but to save some of it um, to maintain level services, fill the gap in 2013, um, and then each successive year meet our level service obligations and then put the remaining revenue into that fiscal stability fund um, with the idea that knowing we would eventually hit the wall again um, and then we would use that that revenue that we put in the fiscal stability fund to then be able to backfill our budget and be able to maintain those level service budget uh, the, the level services so for example the budget you have before you has almost eight hundred thousand dollars of the fiscal stability fund and if you look at our multi-year uh, plan, you'll note that, uh, and I, it's outlined in my budget message, that next year uh, we project that in order to uh, <coughs> provide that same level service budget, we'll have to use the remaining balance of the fiscal stability fund. Um, we'll actually, unfortunately, st still have a deficit after we use the fund. I mean, this is one of the issues about the fiscal stability plan. It was a short-term plan. Um, that's I did not sell it that it was going to be forever um, because of that you know because of the, the structural imbalance we have um, in our revenues and our expenses um, but it's a plan that we were able to use to create some stability for now going on six years um, in order to stave off having to make cuts um, as well as um, you know being able to maintain the services that our that our residents uh, need and deserve so that's the purpose of the fiscal stability fund. It was set up for that purpose. Um, and we are using the funds this year uh, to fund city services. It's embedded in the budget. Uh, but that's sort, of the, that's sort of the way it works. And um, every year I've updated that plan. Um, you can track how much of the fiscal stability fund is needed to fund each of the fiscal years. Um, but as I've said, um, you know, it's basically, uh, I've, I've always described it as a roller coaster where we'd be going up a hill um, uh, but, th but then we'd reach the crest where we would not no longer be able to add money to the fund, which happened uh, a couple of years ago, and then we'd start going down and have to start using the funds. And unfortunately, um, once you start using it, uh, that ride down is uh, much faster uh, because once you use it in one fiscal year, you then have to meet, you have to fill that amount and then fill the next year's amount. So that's the fiscal <coughs> stability fund. Thank you. And one other. So, what is the balance of that, just for folks who might be interested? Uh, right now, I believe it's two point six million. I believe. Six. Yeah, two point six million. And then we use seven. We'll be down to one point eight. Yeah. So it's two point six, and we're using about uh, uh, seven seven eight. Seven seven eight. Mm -hmm. um, and so next year we would use the remaining balance um, in order to fund uh, level services. And I know you've mentioned before that. Um, the existence of our fiscal stability fund has a, had a direct impact <coughs> on our AAA and other ra ratings that allow us borrowing authority at better rates. And maybe you could just. Yeah, I mean, we have the fiscal stability fund. We also have our capital stabilization account, and we have our regular stabilization account. And one of the goals um, um, over the last seven plus years has been, you know, when we were in the last recession, we had basically drawn down all of our funds. Um, because of you know basically a worldwide economic recession and massive cuts and and so um, when I one of my goals when I became mayor was to rebuild those so we've tried to do that very steadily um, and guess when we do meet with um, our bond rating agencies which is in this case is standard and Poor's, um, they rate us they they we we meet with them annually um, they go through all of our um, audited statements. They go through all of our financials. Uh, we do a conference call with one of their analysts, uh, usually Susan Wright and I, and our outside auditor and the um, treasurer collector, and um, and then they assign us a rating for our credit. And our credit worthiness, not unsurprisingly, if you look at your own credit score, a lot of it is about you know how much debt do you have, how much savings do you have, how much financial flexibility do you have, are you a good credit risk. And so one of the things we've done over the last several years is try to, is try to rebuild our credit, basically. Um, and we have done that, and we have now achieved and maintained for the last several years a AAA bond rating, which is the highest bond rating, which means that when we go out to borrow, 
um, for school roofs or all the paving we're doing this year, we're able to secure a much more favorable rate. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, our municipal bonds went out onto the bond market, um, about $3.85 million worth of bonds for various capital projects. Uh, we had 10 bidders, um, and the net interest rate that we secured for that $3.8 million is about 1.5%. Um, so that means that then translates into lower debt service and the ability to do more and to fix more and to, um, and to not have to use more general fund money. So, um, and again, I, I always have to emphasize that the monies that we put into those um, stabilization, when we make a decision to put them in the stabilization account, sometimes they're part of um, free cash at the end of the year, um, which is the undesignated fund balance that we then put in there. Um, that's one-time money. It's money that is not a recurring revenue at that point. Um, so uh, that's why we use it on one-time expenses, you know, on equipment, on capital, on roads, on sewer, on all those various things, um, because it's a one-time revenue. Um, so that is the, that's the purpose of it, and we have very detailed um, debt policies and very detailed policies with regard to the uh, way that we, the levels that we keep uh, in your capital improvement uh, plans or programs that you have, uh, we discuss those policies in terms of um, when we start drawing down on the capital stabilization fund to fund capital projects based on the size of that fund as a percentage of the budget. Um, and these are all the documents that Standard & Poor's looks at um, when they look at our financial management. So uh, I, know it's ch I know it's difficult um, when people hear that you know, um, we're uh, doing capital projects or we're borrowing money to fix roads, although I don't think people are complaining that we're fixing roads necessarily, but um, uh, there's sometimes a sort of a disconnect between capital uh, funding or the use of stabilization funds versus general fund revenue to um, to just run the day-to-day -day operations, and that's always the balancing act. Okay, thank you. Yep. Councilor Dwight. The, um, it's worth noting because what you just heard described and the way the mayor and, and Susan Wright actually have been conducting um, fiscal policy um, was actually, now, first of all, I must preface it by saying I was absolutely opposed to Proposition 2.5 and, and still stand against it, but the premise that was advanced by the proponents of Proposition 2.5 was to do just this, to compel cities to have long-term planning with the built-in, it's called 2.5 for a reason, it's not because that was a catalog number, it means 2.5%. It was supposed to run about a half percent below the projected inflation rate, knowing that, that it, was, it was set up for failure. It was designed to structurally require communities to ask their citizens, hat in hand, with an explanation and make your case for why you need to increase revenue, uh, need to increase uh, taxes in order to generate revenue. And the idea was that communities will, on, on a regular or periodic basis, come and ask for money from their community and, and in, in the form of an override. Well, the problem was is politically it's now been demonized to suggest that when it is a mark of a failure, a, 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 a municipal failure, because if you have to ask for an override, you're not living within your means. No, your means are actually limited on purpose to make it so that you can't, you actually won't live within your means and that you are required to ask the public for permission to raise money. And so politically, it's always a heavy lift because it also comes on the, as I said, on the, on uh, it comes down on the backs of property owners, and I've already given my rant about regressive taxation. But the fact is, is that the mayor did, pr the mayor and Susan did precisely what you should do: the long-term planning when you ask for an override to build into it the protections that would allow you to sustain the and stabilize the economy of the community for as long as you possibly can. The mayor said from the out outset even in the appeal and every form that he ever went and asked for uh, when, the, uh, <coughs> when this override was first proposed, the last one, knowing that there was an end game. And in fact, actually you expected it to come much sooner. Um, fortunately, because revenues improved over the uh, period immediately following and some very good fiscal responsibility, we didn't have to dip into the reserves that were <coughs> established and we were able to 
extend it this far, which is actually pretty remarkable. And at the same time, achieve a AAA bond rating, which is really even, and I don't think we've ever really fully appreciated the magnitude of that, that very responsible fiscal management. I'm a fiscal conservative, according to Standard & Poor's. I, yeah, <laughs> well, I was, try, I was trying to avoid uh -huh. slurs. I didn't want to, I thought I was saying, I've never been I was trying, yeah. Well, yes. But that, and I think to that extent, uh, no, uh, a, a fiscal pragmatist, I think, is more appropriate. And with buy-in from this council and support from this council for that, knowing that this, these were the circumstances, also knowing that we were going to be having another emotional discussion and debate about the possibility of having an override. And we've come to that point. The, we've, we're at the crossroads now. The only other thing I would say is that I also prefaced it that we need to make reforms at the state level. Oh, yeah. So, so right. that was what was forcing us into Well, that was my original rant. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So and here we are myself you know, as six, far as year, six yeah. years later, and we are still facing the same issue. Well, the, the problem is, is you're punished for your, your successes. And this is also actually how we, how we got to where we were relative to ed reform. We were punished for our successes. For our initial large investment into the schools uh, years ago under Mary Ford, we, our, our, snap, our fiscal snapshot in investment in schools, was, that's the reference point. And as a result, we are punished because we actually, we showed that we could do this and that we will do this when push comes to shove. And the state seems to say, well, okay, fine, you're good. We'll move on and we're, you know, you're an anomaly. And there's a few other communities similar to Northampton. You're an anomaly and we're not going to address the anomaly. It's a growing uh, number of approaching yeah. 90. And so we're waiting for critical mass, but in the meantime, we're still sitting with these tough and emotional So I just wanted to make that clear that we yes. were sort of a stopgap measure, hoping that some of the larger issues would be addressed, yeah. including, including the progressive income tax, a, a number of other things. One more try at the progressive income tax. Well, the 2023. So, so, but I mean, that's the larger context, and so it was an education hard learned by me from when I first was elected, and um, had uh, believed more in unicorns and rainbows, not so much anymore, and so it's incumbent, and it falls upon us, and it falls upon particularly on the executive, whom I've, uh, this is a really long roundabout way of saying actually, um, honoring the work that you've done and hopefully expressing to the community that, that this is, they're not little pockets of slush funds in order to, to fund um, whatever pet projects you have and so on and so forth. That this is, this, we always have these tough discussions and particularly when it comes around uh, uh, contract negotiation time, these conversations come up. And as we noted, the, the police department also, one of the lower paying agencies in the region and it's, it's difficult to maintain the salaries and maintain these uh, great departments. And, these, and our departments actually, by most um, comparisons with other communities, do much better, if not on a par, then much better than other communities. So, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. You, you want to add something? No question to, mark. No, I was okay, just making yeah, sure. No, no yeah, Barge. I forgot the question mark. Sorry. Councilman Barch, thank you. Um, Mayor, I did ask the <coughs> superintendent, provost, last night, in regards to our part of the city, we gave you permission to hire um, Collins from the University <coughs> of Mass, and I was very surprised to hear that they've never done a study like we have citywide, because if their budget, there are discrepancies going on there with wages between um, Custodians in that I'm confused. Why? How come we're yeah, part of this city? Why wasn't it all done for school committee too? So I can't really discuss what's because of litigation. Well, just on the school side, it's collective bargaining. Um, so I can't really discuss those discussions. But I I'm can just tell you that as a result of the of your comments last night, there <laughs> was communication between um, NACE and uh, the school committee, um, and we reprovided documents that we had provided to them in, in collective bargaining. 
um, as well as uh, additional backup information. Um, but again, okay. um, the 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 Collins Center that you're discussing was part of city collective bargaining right. with city uh, bargaining units. Yes. It's completely separate. We, it's not something that's part of uh, school collective bargaining. But why so don't they a, do it? I don't get um, that. Well, I again, I, I don't really want to, I can't really get into the details of what's being discussed in collective bargaining okay. on the school side. I'm sort of wearing two hats. I collectively bargain for the city. And I'm, a, I'm a school committee member for the school side, um, but I can't really speak about ongoing collective bargaining um, on the school side. Um, that's a that's a matter that they have to come to agreement on. I also brought up about the um, Prop Two and a half, and I have teachers on my ward. I have people who are work in the cafeteria and that, and I agree with Councilor Bill Dwight. We all don't like to hear Prop Two and a half. I do not like a Prop Two and a half, and I have concerns, Mayor, of like every Prop Two and a half we've done and I have the breakdown on them of not doing it until the following year when you know that the money is going to be really coming down. And I have the dates, the months when you've done it, and people are really upset that you are making it happen this year when you did, and I know I had talked with Susan about this, people attended the budget hearings, and you did say some down, some way down the line that we're going to go ahead and we're going to have to look at an override. You did say that, so you. I've been saying that for seven years. I've been well, saying. Well, no, it. you've been I've saying been that longer than that. <laughs> I'm just saying. I've, I, I've I understand saying that. Year. Yeah. But then when I talked with Susan, she did say, "Well, because you mentioned it at City Council when you read off your speech, okay that." As of September, you're coming to City Council to place it on the ballot for an override for us councilors to go ahead and approve. But it was never mentioned. But Susan explained to me you had not completed really. You were waiting to see if other things would have to be added on. To we, 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 as I, you know, and at my town hall budget meetings, I did talk about override. I did talk about the timing of an override. And That's what I'm saying. Yeah, People like were shocked with that because when you mentioned it here at city council, you didn't do it at the budget hearings. Susan explained to me that apparently there could have been reasons for that because you were not quite finished yet we hadn't finalized the budget that's for right sure. we did not know what the right and people was. didn't realize in terms that of the november thing I, I just want to be clear so um we're about to enter fiscal year 2020 um and uh which starts you know in understand few, you know, whatever july 1st is how many days that is it's the six now um and so uh i will be coming to you in january um, to basically open the FY 2021 budget mm -hmm. process. And so we basically, we're always working on the budget. And so what we've typically done in the past is we've, um, we've waited until the end of June. Um, we've passed uh, budgets with draconian cuts in them. Um, and then we've done a proposition two and a half override and said like, you know, please, you know, please save us. Um, and so I feel because we've, because we've had a multi-year plan, uh, because we've been doing these forecasts, because you can read the front page of the Gazette two years ago, um, front page story, me saying that the cliff is 20, you know, we're, we, I can still see the, you know, the good news is we haven't hit the cliff. The bad news is the cliff is there. And if things don't change at the state level, at the end of FY 2020, we're going to need to have another mm -hmm. com conversation about an override. So I mean, it's not so I feel like I would like to have a responsible conversation with the taxpayers, we're having a municipal election, um, where we're trying to decide the future of our governance. Um, and it feels like a significant issue. Plus, it's already an election that we've, we're paying for, we're not paying for an extra election. We haven't so, in the other term. Every well, we other time that we've had election. one mayor, yes, it was a special election. Which you have to pay for. We had to pay for. Yeah. I have that exactly. down. Yeah. And so the challenge, so that was my idea. Obviously, I also said in my budget message that we would be, um, once we complete this budget, we'd obviously be looking at forecasting. We'd look at what state government does, and we'd be trying to forecast what, what type of an override that may be. 
Um, so, you know, if suddenly, you know, Governor Baker wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, let's raise taxes. And, um, it will. And, and Speaker DeLeo says, that's a great idea, Governor. I'm with you. Um, then we won't have to have an override. Um, but the likelihood of that happening is, you know, in Easter Bunny territory. Uh, uh, you got it. So, <laughs> so I do out. feel like we have to be responsible and have a responsible conversation with people. And I think a municipal election is the perfect time to do that. And I, as I said in my budget message, I'm prepared to go to every ward in this city and to talk to as many people about why we're in this situation and why um, they have a choice in terms of if we want to continue our level of services that we'll have to pay more at the local level. So that's that's, that's why the November issue, but obviously it's not set in stone. It's not, it's not you know, chiseled in stone. Um, it could change, obviously, to, if we think that there's some uh, you know, change on the horizon that might happen. But, you know, Governor Baker's gonna be issuing his 2020 budget in January. Um, and then we go into our speed mode to try to put together our budget and, and, and watch the whole process. Mm -hmm. It's like Groundhog Day. In it our is, lives. right. Um, one so rabbit. The budget one process rabbit. just keeps coming out. Over Thank you, over. Mayor. So that's my response to that. Councilor Murphy. Um, yeah, I mean, from a finance committee perspective, it is only prudent to begin your budget planning for 2021 knowing how much money you're going to have in your budget. I mean, we start capital improvements in October and November for, for a budget for the next year. It would be nice to be able to go into planning for capital improvements and start the budget process knowing whether we have the money or we don't have the money. Uh, it, to me, it's ludicrous to, to go all the way to when the budget's presented without knowing how much money you're going to have in the budget. You know, it, and it is ultimately up to the taxpayers. Taxpayers are going to decide whether they want to give us the money or whether they don't. And then based on their answer, we're going to plan a budget to reflect what their wishes were. And and to not do it in November before we start planning the fiscal year budget for 2021 is is not prudent or responsible. We we do need to know before we do the budget. And it's only it's only responsible way to do it. So, you know, in that sense I concur. I mean it's ultimately up to the voters whether they give us the money or not, but it's only prudent for us to plan a budget knowing whether we have the money or not. Um, I will just take a second to say um, thank you to Councilor Dwight for really crystallizing this issue, which is that, yes, the system is set up to fail and that it's set up so that we can't possibly level fund. That's just the way it is. Um, and then you, you add into that that the state shortchanges us on Chapter 70 money um, and really shortchanges Northampton in particular on charter reimbursement money. Um, and not to mention Chapter 90 infrastructure money, which has just stayed stagnant for years and years and years. So it's it it's this is the system we have to work in, and we're all in this together, and yes. we have to figure out how to move forward. But um, it is in no way our fault that we find we've done nothing but uh, handle this responsibly. And this is and we're not unique. All other cities and towns are in the same situation. This is what the system is. So. On that note, break time. <laughs> note. Um, uh, move to close public meetings. Hearing. Oh, a second. Second it. All those in public meetings are going to go worldwide. <laughs> 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 yeah. All those in favor of closing the public hearing on the budget. Aye. 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 Hearing is closed. Okay. Um, moving on to. Uh, with the council's permission and in the interest of the people here, I'm going to move the updates from the council president, who's also not here, to the end of the agenda, if that's okay with all, and um, move on to recognitions and one-minute announcements. Oh, Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Um, this Sunday, June 9th, the Northampton Community Rowing Organization uh, we'll be holding uh, an event at the community boathouse off of Damon Road uh, in the uh, Connecticut River Greenway State Park. Uh, at 10.30 in the morning, there will be uh, a gathering of any, any rowers from going back 20, 21 years who would like to come and jump in, the, jump in a boat and, and, and row. But the serious event will be at noon, there will be a, a boat dedication. Uh, one of the original rowers who rowed in the very first boat to go from Hamp High to the head of the Charles 
uh, tragically died this last year, and the community has raised money to um, dedicate a boat in her name. So the Kendra A. Rowan uh, boat will be dedicated uh, at roughly noon on Sunday. So I would like to put a call out to all previous high school rowers and families and master's rowers who might want to participate in some part of these uh, events, fun and solemn, on uh, Sunday at the Connecticut River Boathouse. Um, I'll give my charter review committee report. How's that? And then we'll you can wait to end the agenda. <laughs> yeah. now, if like. um, <laughs> the, the charter review committee has met. Uh, the most recent meeting saw two members of the public speaking, uh, one in favor of term limits, and another one asking about um, committees uh, that answer to the city council. Uh, I explained that, that the council can establish committees that uh, is answerable to uh, the council. And I think it cleared up the question. She had thought that all committees, large and small, all responded to the mayor. Those are mayoral committees. I explained that the, the council also has the authority to do something similar. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, Attorney Newman had followed up with some proposed language to um, well, emphasize or elucidate what's already embedded in the charter, which is mass general law determining the authority given to legislative bodies. Um, it's not explicitly said in the charter that the council has the right to create ordinance laws and rules, nor, and as such, but that's actually described and defined under Massachusetts general law, which the opening lines of the charter already state, and, and I believe the original drafters of the charter thought it would be redundant. It's sort of like saying all, uh, um, all council members must be Americans or something, which is a given. But um, Attorney Newman offered some language, um, which was introduced in the minutes in the hopes that Attorney Newman will be able to come and represent his own case because um, unfortunately he had to rely on me and, and I wasn't in agreement, so I, I had offered that. Um, I'm probably not the best representative of that. Um, also coming up is, will be the discussion, the expanded discussion about um, uh, the possibility of changing the clerk's position from an elected to an appointed position. And there was a report given uh, uh, by one of the Charter Review Committee members, uh, Robbie Sainer, had, had done some research. There's more research to be realized and there will be we will be hearing, hopefully, there will be an invitation extended to the three um, living uh, city clerks, um, and Adam Murray, uh, Chris Skrupski, and Wendy Mazza to come and speak and share their thoughts on this issue. And that's that. Uh, Council of the Barge, one minute, uh, minute announcement. Do you know when that would be? We don't know. We're sending the invitations out, so it oh. depends on what their response would be, so. Councilor, <clears throat> through the chair. Would that also include the current city clerk? The current city clerk has been in consultation throughout. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mentioned yeah. the others. Yeah. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we've been in a lot of communication with you. Do you have any further communication at this moment? I think I've reached my max. Okay. That brings us to resolutions. We have one resolution on the agenda for this evening. It is 19.091 uh, in the City Council, June 6, 2019, upon the recommendation of Councillor Elisa F. Klein, Councillor Gina Louise Shara, a resolution affirming support for access to safe and legal abortion in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the United States. Whereas, on January 22nd, 1973, in a historic and landmark decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade that the U.S. Constitution safeguards a woman's ability to make her own personal medical decisions about when or whether to have children, as grounded in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which protects against the state action, protects against state action the, pri the right to privacy, including a woman's qualified right to terminate her pregnancy. And whereas this right has been affirmed in subsequent sp Supreme Court cases, such as Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992 and Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt in 2016, whereas 
the Trump-Pence administration's repeated tax on and stated desire to restrict access to abortion and other reproductive health care have given states across the United States a green light to pass unconstitutional barriers to safe and legal abortion. And whereas many states, including Alabama, Kentucky, Georgia, and Missouri, have, in direct conflict with the Supreme Court precedent, recently passed laws that ban or restrict access to legal and safe abortions, and similar measures have been proposed in several more states. And whereas, with the appointment last year of Justice Brent Kavanaugh tipping the US Supreme Court in favor of restricting abortion, these state laws are additionally intended to serve as test cases for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade and effectively restrict or eliminate access to legal and safe abortions across the country. And whereas reproductive health, including abortion, is a vital component of overall health, and healthcare is recognized as a fundamental human right, and whereas, as individuals' freedom to make reproductive decisions is vital to their safety, well-being, economic opportunity, and ability to participate equally in society, and whereas, if health insurance coverage for abortion is restricted, this restriction harms most those who already face significant barriers to receiving high-quality health care, such as low-income individuals, immigrants, young people, people of color, and transgender and gender non-conforming people. And whereas, when an individual is denied access to abortion, they are more likely to fall into poverty than an individual who has been able to get an abortion. And whereas, the UN Human Rights Committee stated in 2018 that governments, quote, should not introduce new barriers and should remove existing barriers that deny effective access by women and girls to safe and legal abortion, end quote. And whereas, the Massachusetts State Senate is currently considering S-1209 an act to remove obstacles and expand abortion access, also known as the Roe Act, co-sponsored by State Senator Joanne Comerford and the Massachusetts House is considering uh, H3320, an act removing obstacles and expanding access to women's reproductive health, co-sponsored by State Representative Lindsay N. Sabadosa, both bills serving as a buttress to the 1981 Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court's codification of the right to abortion in the Commonwealth by <coughs> removing prejudicial language in the general law, removing gestational, gestational age from the language so termination may still occur for fetal abnormalities, allowing additional monies to be used to fund procedures for those who do not qualify for mass health, and removing judicial bypass, which is particularly crucial for minors in the foster care system and other situations. And whereas State Representative Lindsay N. Sabadosa has introduced in the House HD 3658, an act to require public universities to provide medication abortion, calling for the establishment of a fund, of, of a, quote, fund to be known as the Public University Health Center Sexual and Reproduction Health Preparation Fund for Medical Abortion Readiness, end quote, to be administered by the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women and calling for, quote, a grant of $200,000 to um, each public university health center to pay for the cost, both direct and indirect, of med medical abortion readiness, end quote, and whereas at the federal level, the U.S. Senate is considering S-758, co-sponsored by Massachusetts Senators Edward J. Markey and Elizabeth Warren, and the U.S. House is considering H-1692, both bills known as the Equal Access to Abortion Coverage in Health Insurance Each Woman Act of 2019, to ensure equal, affordable access to abortion for all women equally, and among other provisions, <laughs> prohibits political interference with decisions of private health insurance companies to offer coverage for abortion care and requires federal health insurance programs, including Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP, to provide coverage for abortion services. And whereas, also at the federal level, Senators Markey and Warren are co-sponsoring S-1645, quote, a bill to protect a woman's ability to determine whether or not to bear a child or end a pregnancy and to protect a health care provider's ability to provide reproductive health care services, including abortion services, end quote, also known as the Women's Health Protection Act, WHPA. And in the House, Representative James P. McGovern is co-sponsoring H.R. 2975, quote, the Women's Health Protection Act, end quote, that, create, um, that creates federal protections against state restrictions on reproductive health care by establishing a statutory right for health care providers to provide and their patients to receive abortion services free from medically unnecessary restrictions, limitations, and bans that delay and at times completely obstruct access to abortion. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton hereby states its commitment to the protection of abortion rights, reproductive health care rights, and individuals' rights to make reproductive decisions about their own bodies. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton does hereby support the immediate passage of Massachusetts Senate Bill S-1209 uh, 
an act to remove obstacles and expand abortion access, House Bill H3320, an act removing obstacles and expanding access to women's reproductive health, and HD3658, an act to require public universities to provide medication abortion to reinforce the Commonwealth's constitution that recognizes the legal right to abortion. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton does hereby support the immediate passage of S758 and HR 1692, both known as the Equal Access to Abortion Coverage in Health Insurance, Each Women Act of 2019, to ensure equal access to reproductive and abortion health care to all individuals across the United States, no matter their income level, source of health care coverage, immigration status, race, age, or gender identity. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton does hereby support the immediate passage of S1645 and HR 2975, the Women's Health Protection Act, to assure the right to access abortion care free from bans, obstacles, and restrictions not required for other health care services. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the City Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator Edward J. Markey, U.S. Representative James P. McGovern, Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, lead sponsor of S-1209, State Senator Harriet L. Chandler, lead sponsors of H-3320, State Representatives Patricia A. Adad and J.D. J. Livingstone, State Senator Joanne Cumberford, and State Representative Lindsay Savages. Second it. Okay. And me in a second. <laughs> I'm going to let uh, Councilor Labarge go first. <laughs> Excuse me. Can I ask, since you're the only sponsor here now, yeah. I think it's appropriate that you should, your presentation go first. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Dwight. Um, I, uh, I know that this was a very full agenda to have added this resolution to, but I hope that you will all agree that the urgency is absolutely warranted. I'm going to keep these remarks relatively brief um, as the resolution lays it out very, very well, and I certainly can't match the heartfelt um, eloquence of those who spoke at public comment. Uh, I'm very sorry that Councilor Klein can't be here. Um, I thank her for in her incredibly intensive work on this. Um, I also want to thank the organizations and residents that assisted and lent their expertise and voice to it, including the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts, Hampshire's Civil Liberties and Public Policy Program, the Pioneer Valley Women's March, Liz Friedman, Jennifer McKenna, um, the Alliance, State Advocates for Women's Rights and Gender Equality. Uh, I'm sure there are others. I really apologize for anyone I've left out. Um, we take for granted our, that our rights here in the Commonwealth, um, and we take for granted our rights, and we think that what's happening in other states can't happen here. Uh, we also incorrectly believe that we have very robust and excellent abortion rights here in Massachusetts. I think you've heard tonight that um, we are lacking in our coverage. Um, we need to wake up and fight for these fundamental rights because judicial precedent isn't enough protection, especially when it's under constant attack, as Roe has been since its decision in 1973. And as we see during these particular times of legislative and judicial crisis, um, like we're in right now, that uh, no amount of protection is enough. Not only do we need to fight to maintain these rights, but we need to modernize and strengthen these rights. The bills supported in the resolution do just that. The acts co-sponsored by Senator Cumberford and Representative Sabadoza remove prejudicial barriers and protect against the chipping away of reproductive health rights. And they expand access and resources which, resources which we've heard are very badly needed here in Massachusetts. Uh, the federal bills are to ensure equal access to health care rights and protect against the absurd restrictions that have nothing to do with health care and are meant to make it impossible to provide access to abortion. They also seek to halt the extreme and unconstitutional attempts to completely obstruct access entirely, like we're seeing in some states right now. As we know, this has really never been about protecting life, and the restrictions have never been about increasing safety for those seeking abortions. They are all about cruelty and control over women and those that can give birth. So uh, I ask you to join me in demanding the right to bodily autonomy and access to reproductive health care for all in Massachusetts and across the United States. 
and I'll, can I make one more, one more kind of personal note? Yes. Um, so I've had the privilege um, during my career to have worked for Planned Parenthood and NARAL and to have worked in the ACLU's, ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. And I worked on some of these cases that involve judicial bypass and parental consent and um, cases that involve uh, fetal abnormalities um, and the need for um, abortions later in terms. And those stories are, they haunt me. So they're some of the most just heartbreaking things you'll ever hear. Anybody who thinks that um, these rights and decisions are about anything other than uh, a, a person at their most horrible, gut-wrenching time um, needing access to their health care really knows absolutely nothing about what this is. They can't access that pain in any way. They have no idea. Those are my comments. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Do you want to speak? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, oh, okay. No, it's your turn. No, I was pointing to yep. um, I feel this is the greatest crisis in abortion that we are um, forced with right now. I feel we need to make sure everyone who needs care has the rights and the resources to access it. I feel we need to stop the attacks on women and pregnant women and ensure access to safe and legal abortion in Massachusetts <coughs> and in all our 50 states. I feel this is my right and every woman's right, our body and our choice. It's not President Trump and his administration to say what my choice is or any other woman or any person that is pregnant. It is our right with our body. I support the Roe Act as everybody else does in this room, which I heard. And I want to thank State Rep. Lindsay Sabadosa for being here tonight and also being there for the protection of all of us women in the state of Massachusetts and in the 50 states. And I feel we all need to stand up, be strong, and work together and win on it. Thank you all. Um. You know, it's, it's often been said, it, there, there, there is no other equivalent law, particularly as it relates to men, that imposes laws on how we will make our choices relative to our, our health care choices. The difference being, of course, um, women actually are, in, in, in the paternalistic structure, are considered vessels not autonomous people with the right to choose and make their own health care decisions. Um, it, it's, the, what we're experiencing now is actually a reduction of rights in, in, in so many ways, but the fact is established by law rights that we were going forward believing that existed and as such are changing drastically with and in the direction of reducing the rights as opposed to expanding them, which is really disturbing. That's not a conservative response. It's a response of a, of a patriarchal structure that's actually designed to control and manage the lives of its citizens, and particularly in this case, women. Um, So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's with a, it, it's awe and shame that um, brings me here to talk about this because the shame of being basically of a cohort that's actually dictated the terms for another cohort that we have no rights over. We should not have. It's unique. There's, as I said, there's no other system of law that actually governs any other dimension of any other person's lives 
except in this one unique case. And it's governed by, you know, uh, um, uh, paternalistic religious structures that um, have declared primacy in the United States, that, that this is actually a, a country of religious freedom, not religious rule. And imposing, we, we, we've, we have actually most of these laws predicated on this. We are functioning in a way of, uh, you know, you often hear a number of conservatives decrying the prospect of coming under Sharia law. This is a moral equivalent of that. And I, I, the shameful part is that we actually have to have this resolution that our legislators and our, and our representatives actually have to craft a law to counteract, just to simply counteract, not to even expand the rights, but to counteract the diminution of rights. That's the shameful part. So obviously, I'm not going to have a problem voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scherer, for introducing this resolution, and to Councillor Klein. I expressed my thanks last night. Um, and to everybody who came up and spoke today, especially to Rep. Sabadosa and to Senator Comerford, who are championing this effort at the State House. Um, for those of us, I think a number of us here were around in 1973 when Roe v. Wade was decided, and you know, uh, I was still uh, you know under age. But you know, for any of us who, knew, for women, who knew what that meant, it, it was really, really incredible. To, to know that that option was available for any person who got pregnant, um, expect, especially in, in a, you know, who was unexpectedly made pregnant by rape or incest. Or, but just generally knowing that that decision would then belong <clears throat> to me or to um, my sisters or friends or people in my family. And so in these last few months, um, as these states have kind of just uh, ratcheted up this clampdown, it's been um, pretty, pretty scary. So, uh, and realizing some aspects of Massachusetts law that I wasn't as familiar with, um, I'm, I'm just really heartened by the fact that in this state, <coughs> we, can, uh, we can challenge that kind of uh, crackdown on on our rights. So I appreciate I appreciate all the efforts here, and I know that oftentimes we you know wonder you know whether resolutions from the city council are appropriate. But there's in this case here certainly appropriate, especially when we hear from our state rep that that gives her the ammunition to go back in and speak to her colleagues when she can say this is from my city council and uh, the citizens of Northampton. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Nash. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilor Shara and Councilor Klein for bringing this resolution forward. I also want to thank those who spoke tonight both for and against uh, this resolution. Um, you know, this, this is an issue you know, I kind of hate. I really don't like it. I, it, it. It really is so horribly divisive and horribly divisive about uh, what is such a really uh, deeply harrowing private decision. Um, you know, I, I'm Catholic. I'm from, I was raised Catholic. I'm from Missouri. Um, last week I was down visiting uh, my mom who recently moved into an apartment and then it was my time to spend, you know, a week with her and to just, um, you know, see how she's doing. You know, and we had lots of lovely discussions, you know, uh, mom's doing great. But, you know, we, we were, we're also covering a lot of, you know, current topics and the topic of the uh, Governor Northrup uh, con uh, radio conversation came up and uh, uh, talked about a late-term abortion and how difficult that was. It brought tears to my mother's eyes 
and um, and that we had this moment where it, it, where we were just on opposite sides. You know that here I was with my mother, raised by you know in, ingrained in the Catholic Church, and me on the other side, and and we, you know. She, she looked at me and she said, you know, you know, uh, something to the effect of like, you know, Jimmy, how can you allow this? You know, how can you vote for this? And, um, and that's why I don't like it. <laughs> I, I don't like to take stances different from um, my mother and that um, who thinks about things extremely deeply um, uh, uh, and, and in ways that would blow a lot of people's minds uh, that, um, uh, that I am going to vote yes for this resolution because it during, you know, I, I have known peop women in my life who've had to make this decision and they did not set out in their life to have an abortion. They ended up in a situation where it was the choice they had to make, mm -hmm. you know, and that, um, that I, I am supportive of them having having the right to make that difficult decision, mm -hmm. um, and um, I also my my back goes up when when you know it, there's been a, a lot of focus on the late term abortion, which is it, it's just it's it's a harrowing terrible situation where you have a um, a, a child that is not properly um, coming along is probably dying and a parent who doesn't want to <laughs> give this child up and this becomes this you know oh that there's some cavalier decision made by the parent they just don't want the baby you know um, uh, Shaniqua I think spoke to that I didn't get your last name but um, that you know that these are women who are you know are in in the the rock and the hard place, the worst place, one of the worst places in life to be. And that, um, so I am uh, very much in support of this place, having, women having this decision, as Counselor Dwight had said, that we, I as a man, man, I'm not placed in that. And that, um, and I think it's, I as, uh, as, as a man need to support women's right to be able to you know, when they're, you know, to have the right to make that decision and not to, you know, and, and recognize that it's their right and support them to make that decision. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I too appreciate uh, the work of the, of the sponsors in bringing this, this forward. Um, in, it's only in recent months that I've understood um, how weak uh, in Massachusetts uh, our, 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 our legislative protection is in, in, in protecting uh, the right of a woman uh, in consultation with hopefully excellent medical advice to make her own decisions about her body. Um, I've focused on the fact that we have strong judicial protections, but it's clear that that's not sufficient. And so uh, I very much appreciate the Roe Act, which takes those judicial protections, codifies them, and while at it, strengthens them um, and uh, provides assurances of greater access. So I am uh, very strongly supportive of, of the Roe Act. <clears throat> at the same time, um, along the lines of uh, what Councillor Nash has been saying, I have struggled to um, listen with a, an open mind and, uh, and an open heart, if you will, to those speaking against uh, the Roe Act uh, and speaking more generally against abortion. And I do recognize, because I have some members of, in my own extended family who, uh, whose motivations are totally heartfelt and sincere in their, in their opposition to uh, abortion, and I, I, I'm not preaching to anyone. I'm talking to myself here about working hard to not uh, demonize and be judgmental, because I understand the the incredible difficulty of the decision and the incredible difficulty of the 
of the issue, and I uh, approach many folks who have a different view on this with, with some benefit, give them some benefit of the doubt as to the sincerity of their motivations. So uh, I just want to, uh, and I should also say I uh, appreciate the fact that folks who have a different view than what this vote is going to be here tonight uh, uh, have, have, have stood up and, and said their piece. I'm sure it was not easy. <clears throat> So I clearly will be, uh, I am supportive of the Roe Act. I did have one question about the resolution, however. I, I've been so focused on the Roe Act that I must say I don't know a great deal about uh, HD 3658, the act requiring public universities to provide medication abortion. I, under, I understand it, how, it, how, it, how it all ties in, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, we have one of the council, only one of the councils or the resolution sponsors here tonight, if could provide a little bit of, of, of background, educate me a little bit on, 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 on this act, you, since, since it's all tied into the same resolution. Uh, would you indulge me in recognizing the sponsor of it? I was hoping you would say that. Representative <laughs> uh, Sabadoza, could <clears throat> you speak briefly on this? Thank you. Um, is there a specific part you'd like me to address, or do you just want me to provide a general overview? A general overview I, I would find very helpful. Absolutely. So the, this legislation is actually based on a piece of legislation that was introduced in California last session, um, and it, advocacy for that was um, coming from in all directions, including here in Massachusetts, and it was something I was working on with students at UMass Amherst. And so when we saw that they had introduced that bill, it got through the legislature. It was vetoed by the governor. It's been reintroduced. We're hopeful that it will pass this time. It's been tweaked a little bit. It felt like it was appropriate to introduce here. Um, a medication abortion, it, it, there are two pills. Um, the first pill is generally taken in the doctor's office. The second <coughs> pill is taken at home. And students um, at public, we targeted public universities only because we're only allowed to do that. But students, particularly at UMass, um, can often find themselves in a bit of difficulty finding a provider. Um, there are private providers at hospitals who are willing to provide abortions. <coughs> that information is not always made publicly available. There, as we've heard, there can be um, people who provide abortions can sometimes feel threatened for doing so and do not always want to make that public. The nearest clinic is in Springfield. Um, if you are a student at UMass Amherst, given what public transportation in this part of the state looks like, that can be really hard to get to. And in addition to that, we have students from all over the country at UMass. They don't know what Western Mass looks like. And when you're already in a situation where time constraints are important, um, costs can be impediments, it felt really essential that health services on campus <coughs> would be able to provide that. So the bill focuses only on campuses that already have health centers that have everything they would need to provide a medication abortion, which again can only be done up to 10 weeks and is two pills. So we're asking, just like we asked them in the past to provide plan B, they didn't used to provide that and we did a lot of advocacy work to make sure that that happened. We're asking them to take this step further to make abortion accessible and affordable to students who are on campus. The students are already covered by um, health insurance on campus. It should, you know, it should make sure that the abortion would be provided <coughs> and, uh, covered as well. And um, it's really just kind of the next step. My priority this legislative session is really the Red <coughs> Act, but it felt particularly in Western Mass where transportation is such a huge barrier that we should do something to make it a little bit easier for people. Um, because again, healthcare is not healthcare unless you can get to it. Um, so that was really the, the heart of the legislation. Thank you, very helpful. Certainly. Is there any, any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Dwight. Um, a, a, a minor amendment. Yes. Uh, in, in what is it? Uh, one, two, three, four. Think of the fourth, whereas yeah. many states, including Alabama, Kentucky, Georgia, Missouri, I went to that Louisiana just most recently. And since the fact that this is moving so fast and in real time, there, there are other states pending as well, and all with the express purpose of bringing for the Supreme Court the opportunity for Brett Kavanaugh, of all people, a person who, who's already showed his disdain for women, is actually 
rather demonstrably, um, we'll have an opportunity <coughs> to uh, decimate, crush, or, or actually completely reverse Roe v. Wade. And, and again, so I think Louisiana needs to be on this list of indicted. I'll that second that amendment. Um, all those in favor of that amendment? Aye. 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 Okay. Any other comments this evening? Um, I'll just make one quick uh, additional comment, which is that um, I just want to say that I support a woman's right to make medical and reproductive decisions about uh, for themselves, regardless of whether that's a hard decision. These aren't always hard decisions. Um, and they don't have to be. It's a woman's body and her right to make those medical decisions about herself. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I would like a roll call, please. Councilor Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. 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 That passes in first reading. Thank you all. Uh, a recess has been called for. Do we have to vote on that? No. We're That's in recess. Okay. How long? Oh. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. That's not a recess. Thank you. Uh.
Okay, so next up we have the consent agenda. We're going to do things a little bit differently tonight in the interest of time. I would like to move that we uh, pull from the consent agenda item 19.060. This is the application for business owner's permit and five taxi cab licenses uh, from Jeffrey Miller Cosmic Cab. Uh, the reason being is the applicant is present. Um, I, I understand the council president's desire is to send the rest of the consent agenda to the end of our agenda tonight, but rather than have Mr. Miller have to sit here for the duration, if we pull this from the consent agenda, vote it up or down, and, and then refer the rest of the consent agenda as you as you express desire to send it towards the end of the agenda. Um. And I don't... I don't think that requires a second. I think any councilor can request okay. a removal of an item, so I believe that that, what I just said, shall be. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it is. Yeah, hello. So, we have 19.060, application for business owner's permit and five taxi cab licenses from Jeffrey Miller Cosmic Cab Company. Um, on uh, May 23rd, the Zoning Board of Appeals issued a finding that the non-conforming commercial use of Hooker Avenue is not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the, than the previous non-conforming use, so the storage maintenance site is in compliance with zoning. So... Do you need a motion? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I th yeah, I I'm sorry. That was, was going to make the motion okay. on the floor for discussion. Uh, I move that we approve for purpose of discussion. Second. And even though this is on the consent agenda and we don't discuss, do we discuss this because we've removed yeah, because it? Right, because, it's because we took it out. Right. That's, it. that's the reason for removal in many cases so that you can actually, and, okay. and just for the purposes of, as we all know that this is a long pending uh, license application that Mr. Miller has uh, finally met all the criteria and requirements and including with this final the final item was the ZBA decision which now determines that he can operate on Hooker Avenue where whereas before that was just pent so I, I it, that's why I believe that it's appropriate at this point to uh, award the licenses as applied for. Uh, yes and I was actually at that zoning board meeting and the neighbors were uh, quite complimentary to Mr. Miller and how he had been cooperating with them in the neighborhood. Okay, uh, Councilor Nash. Yeah, you know, I just want to also recognize Mr. Miller for all of his work to try to work with us around these regulations and working to comply with the regulations that he helped us work on. And um, I, um, you know, that I, I wouldn't want to see him um, uh, 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 put at a um, disadvantage by us not approving this after all of the work that he's done. So, and we also thank him for sitting through many meetings, including this one till 9:40. Well, it, I just to add one more thing: that he is the one cab company who operates in town that is working hard to comply with our regulations. There are others who are operating who, um, you know, even though we have made changes to accommodate cab companies that are not based in Northampton, they've made no effort to comply. Mr. Mm -hmm. Miller is the, has been the one who's worked hard at doing that. That's what I tried to say earlier to come out so good. Councilor <laughs> LaBarge. Yes. Um, I attended one of the zoning meetings um, with Mr. Miller there, and I think it's, what, been about a year now? Just about more than that. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's been longer you than know, a year. And I, I have to say that hearing him when I was at the zoning meeting, um, he abided by what they were saying. They gave him enough of time to go ahead and do exactly what zoning was saying that he had to do. So I feel, um, and to be fair as a city councilor, that he deserves to be approved on this. Any further comments? All those in favor of approving this permit and uh, five taxi cab licenses, please say aye. 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 Any objections? No abstentions? Okay. That has been approved. So, um, thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, 
So now we're going to skip over the rest of the consent agenda and we'll come back to it at the end, whenever the end may be. Um, and we're going to recess for finance. Excellent. <laughs> well, Laura, would you read the role of finance, please? Council here. Present. I'm still here. Excellent. The first thing is approval of minutes of our meeting from May 16th. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Okay. On to the uh, financial orders. The first one is 19081. It's an order to borrow money and authorize acquisition of 100 acres at Pine Grove Golf Course. Um, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz, Planning and Sustainability, and the Conservation Commission. Order that whereas open space and recreation and multi-use trail plans 2018 to 2025 recommends per pre preserving ecology valuable land and filling gaps at Rocky Hill Greenway, and whereas the city is an option to purchase approximately 100 acres at Pine Grove Golf Course to restore the natural uh, ecological functioning, improve the riparian habitat that feeds Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary and expand the adjacent Rocky Hill Greenway. And whereas the seller is retaining land to expand one building lot and create three new building lots, uh, achieve an open space plan recommendation of creating new lots to avoid open space from artificially inflating the cost of building lots in Northampton. And whereas the city is partnering with the Massachusetts Audubon Society and the Kestrel Land Trust, and one or both organizations will hold the required conservation restriction and manage easements at no cost to the city, order that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Mass General Law Chapter 40, subsection 8C, any fee easement or conservation restriction as defined in Mass General Law Chapter 164, subsection 31, or any other interest in the above land and any immediately adjoining land that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restrictions, that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions and related easements on any land so acquired, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized uh, to, to contact for and expend any federal, state, or other aid available for this project, including any grant from the Division of Conservation Services of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs under the Land Self-Help Act, Mass General Law. Chapter 160, oh, no, sorry, 132A, subsection 11, um, with such related restrictions and agreements as the city determines to be agreeable. Further, that $650,000 is appropriated for such acquisition and that to meet this uh, appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow uh, $650,000 under Mass General Law Chapter 44, subsection 7, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to con contract for any federal, state, or other, or other aid available for this project, including any grant from the Division of Conservation Services of, of the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs under the land Self-Help Act, Chapter 132A, Subsection 11 of the Massachusetts General Law. Uh, further, any grants, donations, or sales shall be used to reimburse open space funds used for the purpose. Do we have a motion, Finance? Make a motion. Second. And we have Mr. Fiden here, who can tell us about this 100 acres. Sure. Thank you very much. So I just want to start by saying, even though this is a borrowing authority, we're not going to be borrowing this money. We do this every year. You actually have three items on your agenda later tonight to revoke previous borrowing authority. Um, we're required to do this in order to get the grants we're applying for, and doing it early in the process makes it much more likely we're going to get the grants. But we are asking for authority, obviously, to buy the, the property if you can find it. Um, the other comment I make is we would not be using city general fund revenue for this process, so there'd be a combination of grants. We will be applying for CPA, um, and we'll be doing some fundraising, but, but we don't use general obligation uh, funding for that. Um, so, you know, each year we tend to sort of identify what's one big project we do, so we tend to do a lot of small projects each, each year for land preservation, one large project. This is by far our top priority this year, and frankly our top priority for, for several years. Um, the stream that runs, so that, so that the golf course owner is retiring, it's no longer going to be a golf course. He's been trying to market it for new golf course operators, and the golf courses are not doing well, other than a few rich areas, so there's, there's not a lot of interest in it. 
the stream that runs through this golf course eventually makes it down to the meadows and the Mass Audubon property. So it's a very important part of their connection, both in terms of wildlife coming to and from the meadows and life serve along the, the whole stream. So they're very excited about it. the reason we're doing it. Usually we partner with some nonprofit. The reason our partners for this are both Kestrel and Mass Audubon are because it's such, such a key parcel that's out there. Um, Councilor LaMarche. Um, Wayne, you and I have had um, quite a bit of a conversation about the property itself. And as a city councilor, I have had people approaching me on this property, asking me who the realtor was, which I couldn't answer, and I really didn't care about who hires who as a realtor. And the questions that I had asked you, and I thank you very, very much for that, which I was able to relay. Those answers back was um, follow-up questions. What started the conversation on the purchase of land on Old Wilson Road? That's what I was asked, and you answered that for me, and I appreciate that, where the property, apparently the realtor had approached the family I know the family very, very well. I also know the previous landowners who father had sold that property to this family here. And it is absolutely beautiful, beautiful. I have been there, I have walked it all, and the wildlife is unbelievable. And back in my girlfriend's house, which is further, which abuts it, they owned all that property before, there was 15 deer right out in back of her house. It's nonstop. The turkeys are phenomenal. And it's just like I had to say to some of the people, that's their property. They have rights to go ahead of who they want to hire and do what they want to do with their property. That was their choice of having the city buy the conservation and the wetlands and restore the beauty of that. Where the, right now, the, um, the home where <coughs> and there's a bar and everything, the lounge part of it, that will be torn down. And also there will be four lots, which that one will be on the top and the scenery is off, off it's just beautiful. And there will be three houses um, almost like toward the bottom of it and they will be beautiful homes also. This is what the owners want themselves, not the city <coughs> telling them. And also too, I had received a call from one of my residents who apparently there was some kind of a rumor going around, I went to the mayor on it, that he was buying the golf course and putting up condominiums. And I said, you go back down here at the senior center you go back and tell people that is not true. And I said, furthermore, I said, the city has been approached by the realtor that the family wanted to talk with Wayne, okay, and conservation of the city having the first rights of refusal to buy this property. And that's what they wanted. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I'm really encouraging that the consulars support this because it's beautiful. And I think the way that the owners are handling this is in due respect for the neighbors also, and also connecting the trails, and also working with Arcadia on, on the wildlife. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Now, this, this parcel is, is under Chapter 61, so the city always had the right of first refusal if this was going to change. Almost all, but it's a Almost. very small section. It's not. It's, but yes, it's not, it's but correct. as a golf course, it is. Yeah. I'd seen versions of this plan with more lots on it. Were there more lots? What, ha what happened to? There's four now, but I think there was up to eight on one of them. So for evaluation, so this, this, this plan will show uh, four lots being developed. For valuation purposes, to figure out what's what's the offer we make, mm -hmm. we do a build out analysis. So we we did you know basically pen and paper to say how many lots potentially could be on the property. So that mm -hmm. that's what you're referring to. But mm -hmm. this is the actual final plan. Mm -hmm. Just then, I, I spoke to you about this earlier, but just philosophically, this 
this property now contributes about twelve thousand dollars to the tax base every year, and and I had the same comment last year when with Burt's Bog, which contributed about eight thousand dollars to the tax base, and we're we're starting to take pieces of property that pay considerable taxes, unlike land of Damon in the middle of nowhere out in the woods somewhere. This this stuff between Burt's Bog and this is about twenty thousand dollars that when we take it gets redistributed across the tax base for the rest of the taxpayers to to pay for. And 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 we did one last year, we're doing we're doing another one this year. You know, the, my, my ultimate concern is we're always worried about how affordable housing is and one of the components of that is taxes. And so when we take something and there's no pilot and we take it out of circulation, it does have an effect on the tax rate, be it ever so minor, but the more we do it the more the more it adds up. You know, it's not going to prevent me from being in favor of this project. But when it comes up, I do like to bring it to people's attention that, you know, eight last year, 12 this year, this this tax money comes from somebody else if we take this and take it off the tax rolls, and that's all the rest of the taxpayers. So we need need to be aware of the fact that when we do this, that tax money goes somewhere else. You know, the, the responsibility for those tax payments goes somewhere else. Councillor, can I add, you're absolutely right. In, Philosophically, I agree with yeah. you. In terms of the actual numbers, though, remember the numbers of taxes include the revenue that we get for taxes because there's a cell tower on the site, right. and that's the biggest piece. So the land that's actually in 61B, I don't know the number. I should have checked it before I came here, but I think that portion is is a lot less. Yeah, I think. I mean, I did. I did look at this, and I think that the the market value of it is like a million or nine or something the the chapter 61 value is 675 or something like that yep. so the the tax break is substantial and the twelve thousand dollars is the 61 value without consideration for its full value that's the 61 value and and that little piece with the cell tower does you know is responsible for you know quite a bit of the income um but it you know at the same time that money kind of goes away Councilor dwight you had a well it was relative to the four building lots, which um, you're right. Actually, if, if this were a lot tax rate, be it ever so minor, but the more we do it, the more the more it adds up. You know, it's not going to prevent me from being in favor of this project. But when it comes up, I do like to bring it to people's attention that you know, eight last year, twelve this year, this this tax money comes from somebody else if we take this and take it off the tax rolls, and that's all the rest of the taxpayers. So we need need to be aware of the fact that when we do this, that tax money goes somewhere else. You know, the, the responsibility for those tax payments goes somewhere else. Councillor, can I add, I mean, you're absolutely right. In, in, philosophically, I agree with yeah. you. In terms of the actual numbers, though, remember the numbers of taxes include the revenue that we get for taxes because there's a cell tower on the site, right. and that's the biggest piece. So the land that's actually in 61B, I don't know the number. I should have checked it before I came here, but I think that portion is, is a lot less. Yeah. I think. I mean, I did. I did look at this, and I think that the the market value of it is like a million or nine or something. the The chapter sixty one value is six seventy five or something like that. So the the tax break is substantial, and the twelve thousand dollars is the sixty one value without consideration for its full value. That's the sixty one value, and and that little piece with the cell tower does you know is responsible for you know quite a bit of the income. Um, but it, you know, at the same time, that money kind of goes away. Councillor Dwight, you had a. Well, it, it was relative to the four building lots, which um, you're right. Actually, if, if this were allowed to be fully developed out and in and saturated, it, you would realize more revenue. But is is the valuation on the four lots, the four building lots, somehow offset the the revenue loss that Council Murphy is describing? Yes. No, and we, we did not run a full projection, so I'm not going to give you numbers. But three of those four lots, that have spectacular view of the Hoag Range, would be among the most expensive lots we have with great views. One, the one along Pine or along Old Wilson Road, is going to be more modest. So, you know, very high end. We, we want housing in all price range, but the reality is the very high end housing is the one that we make money on the more modest ones mm -hmm. we don't but i don't so so yes and concept makes up for a lot of it we could run the numbers by your second reading if you want we haven't done that yet mm -hmm. I mean, it would it, as to council murphy's remark it wouldn't affect my vote um but i mean i mean when we're speaking philosophically in that respect 
Is it a zero sum game? Is it is it uh, <coughs> is it a wash or is it, uh, <laughs> it a, a loss, a significant loss of, of taxable revenue or from the current state? So that's that's my question. Well, we're in good shape if those are high-end houses and those kids go to Williston. If they go to Northampton Public Schools, they lose money, ultimately. Uh, well, that's true. And in fact, actually, if that whole property was built out, it would even be greater pressure. And yeah. the cost would be even more substantial. Than um, the, you know, it's, it's been a golf course for a long time. It, because mo there's a lot of wetland there, you know, it probably couldn't even be a golf course today because there's wetlands months. all through the middle of it. So, it, it you know it, it generates the money and it's a golf course because it preceded lots of things. You know, it would never exist if it hadn't preceded right. all of those regulations. So there's no way it's going to be built out. In fact, I think the eight lots or so was pretty much without sewer what it could be because you couldn't perk it. Yeah, all, all good points, and that's that's what that's what my questions were. Is that uh, it, the fact that it will not be a golf course anymore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we lose that revenue regardless. Yeah, if it so. about the only thing it could stay would be a golf course because that's what's grandfathered. I think you couldn't really do much else with it. And it would to, generate that kind of revenue. It would have to be grandfathered in. And, and it's only because it's a pre-existing golf course. Right. It's going to even be that again. Councilor Barge? Yes, I'm Councilor Sherrod. It's in your ward. Have you been there? I've certainly been by it, yes. It's I've never a, golfed there. No, but uh, I mean, you've seen the property yes. inside. It's absolutely beautiful. Stunning. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Bidwell, you had a question. Well, I, I, I think it, it would be helpful. I'd like to take you up on your offer to, to, to run the numbers because it, it doesn't sound to me like it'd be too hard to imagine eight or nine or ten thousand dollars of taxes coming in from from three relatively high end lots, and so mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, we're we might be sacrificing two or three thousand dollars in taxes, and not twelve. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I think it well, wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea to even even though it's going to be a, a rough estimate to, to just. And, and frankly, one of those lots up. built out with an appropriate home is going to generate that kind of revenue. Yeah, you know. So uh, if it's there are a number of houses <coughs> so in we, Northampton that generate twelve thousand dollars tax. We could, we could wind up with I'm just, so we could wind up with more in taxes after than than, than what we get now. Is it, and it, and at the same time have uh, added substantially to yeah. to our conservation holdings. Councilor, <laughs> <laughs> we're wondering about it, um, Wayne. So um, the idea is to return this to forest. Um, it, is there any thought to returning it to what it I, I don't know what it, it doesn't I don't Should think it believes it. in it says in here what it used to be you know 100 years ago 200 years ago maybe it was forest I don't know um, so mass Audubon I you know I, I do a lot of things but I'm not good me <laughs> so mass Audubon is much more specialized so they're taking the lead in sort of a, a rehabilitation plan and so we're just in early stages what I do know for sure is the stream through the middle and the historical wetlands, um, and as Councilor Murphy pointed out, the historical wetlands are a lot bigger than the current wetlands. Those we'd want to restore to their wetlands functioning. Mm -hmm. um, the rest, I think we just need to do more assessment for doing it. The other thing, just to be clear, is it's, it's restoration will be a many year process particularly because it's going to be grant driven. Again, we're not planning to use city funds for doing it. Mm -hmm. So we have a master plan so we know where we're going. Um, but it's going to be a long time to get there in the process. The, the first step would certainly be to restore, nat restore natural flow in the stream. Um, and to the extent that they're exposed, not all of them are, to stop the, the underground drainage that's dewatering the wetlands. So we know where that do that piece, but we don't really know the, the long-term answer to doing it. So to put on my... Uh, uh, pesticide reduction hat which comes up a little later I just know that golf courses are notorious for using all sorts of chemicals and stuff to maintain greens greens especially but also in terms of the fairways and stuff like that are we worried about any of that in terms of as we're restoring this to its natural uh, it, it, restoring it to being a uh, conservation area uh, so in the normal course of these things, we certainly would be doing um, environmental site assessment or a hazardous waste investigation. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any red flags. There's no reason we're particularly concerned, but we're certainly <coughs> going to going to investigate both herbicides and just fertilizers. But we're not particularly concerned at this point. 
property. Okay. It, 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 I will say of the lots that we're carving out, the lot that includes a, a current modest house, that was sort of their operations center. And so we're happy not to inherit that to the extent there was ever a spill mm -hmm. for oil or that kind of thing. That's just not going to be part of our property. Mm -hmm. so, Councilor Bard, you didn't see any three-headed turkeys up there, did you? Yeah. You did see <laughs> Uh oh, gotta be careful. He's looking at one now. And I don't, and I do know that on, on Wilson Road, the neighbors are very happy about the conservation land and also about four houses. So, is there any other any other any other comments? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, hearing hearing none. How do we have a really uh, this goofy guys? A, a motion for a positive recommendation of finance. Aye. 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 <laughs> it's not like a motion and a vote. Is there, <laughs> is there, is in the any not in favor? Let's jump to that. <laughs> okay. uh, moving right along. Uh, Nineteen zero eight two. In order to, we're down to eight five point eight acres in the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway. Order that again. Recommendation of the Mayor, Planning and Sustainability and Conservation Commission. Order that whereas. The Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan 2018 to 2025 recommends preserving ecologically valuable land and filling gaps at the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway. And whereas the city is an option to purchase approximately 5.8 acres off Boggy Meadow Road in the heart of the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway for $6,000. And whereas the city is partnering with Broadbrook Coalition, who we expect will help fund the project. Uh, order that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Mass General Law <coughs> Chapter 40, subsection 8C. Any fee easement or uh, conservation restriction as defined in Mass General Law Chapter 184, subsection 31, or any other interest in the above land and any immediately adjoining land, and that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restrictions, that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions and related easements on any land so acquired and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to con contract for and expend any federal, state, or other aid available for this project with such related restrictions and agreements as the city determines that are agreeable. Further, that any grants, donations, or sales shall be used to reimburse open space funds used for this purpose. We have a motion? Make a motion. And we have a second. Uh, this is an easier one, I guess. Yes, and this is much more modest. It's. Um, we have conservation land sort of all around this area. We would someday like to close off Boggy Meadow Road because not often, but occasionally we have problems with people dumping. Um, and so this land's desirable for a lot of reasons. Um, it's not developed. You can self see from the price, it's, it could never yeah. be developed. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by the rest of the country. Is this one of the last pieces out there? Because I'm assuming the road that old boggy meadow has to provide access to private property out there right so we can't close until we get owners it's two get large owners so the fitzgerald family yep. goes all the way back to fitzgerald fence their property wraps around and actually surrounds right. this property on three sides um and then there's one other private property owner out there. Mm -hmm. this is an odd one i mean because it's, it's very small in the middle there mm -hmm. any questions on this one all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance please say aye aye, aye. any opposed no oh, great all right, um, the next one is 19083, in order to convey a permanent historic preservation restriction for Bridge Road Cemetery. Whereas the Bridge Road, or Bridge Street, not Bridge Road, Bridge Street Cemetery, established in 1661 as the city's oldest place of interment and an important historic landscape that is a critical piece of the Pomeroy Terrace Historic District. And whereas in 2016, Preservation Master Plan for the cemetery identified 13 priority preservation projects necessary to preserve and manage the historic cemetery, <coughs> and whereas the Massachusetts Historical Commission um, Preservation Project Funded a, uh, funded a grant up to 50% reimbursement for projects that support the preservation of properties, landscapes, and sites listed in the State Register of Historic Places, which requires that areas selected for funding be protected by permanent preservation restrictions. And whereas the city has received $50,000 in state funds to conserve the highest priority threatened gravestones at the cemetery, order that the city acting through its mayor is authorized to convey a perpetual historic preservation restriction on the Bridge Street Cemetery to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by and through the Massachusetts Historical Commission, further that the city of Northampton confirms 
fee title of the Bridge Street Cemetery, an ancient burial ground for which no deed of record is found. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. So this one's fairly straightforward. Just two points I want to point out. One is we're choosing the boundaries of the cemetery as basically being the fence itself. So that way we're preserving all the history, but some of you may know there's been a lot of discussion about Bridge Street School and should there be on-street parking and should there be sidewalks. We didn't want to do anything that limits that, so we're far enough away from the road that if the final, I'm not suggesting that is the solution, but if the final solution is on-street parking, there's room to do that. We could expand the right-of-way. Um, the other thing that's weird about the deed is these very old properties don't have deeds. There was a grant, I guess, of, from from the king, I'm not sure of the process, but we went through this. Some of you, I can't remember how long this was, some of you may have been in council when we acquired Sheldon Field. It was a similar <laughs> process. There wasn't a deed for it, and so we're actually going to be granting a deed to ourselves because that's the condition of the grant we have. A question? Um, you're not preserving the uh, fence, though, right? Because I would <laughs> not as love as someday <laughs> for it to right. be nicer. But it, we're just sort of seeing it as that's the limit of the hollow ground. The that's just one of my personal things that I've always would love to see Bridge Street Cemetery to not have that fence around it because it's one of the most beautiful places. Councilor Nash. Uh, uh, Director Feiden, um, in terms of uh, what we're doing right here, it, it's going to allow us to be uh, open up to future grants and, I mean, that's correct. It, it allows us this grant we already have. So we have two grants right now. We have so we're state. doing a little catch up here, maybe, we're or a little catch up here. Okay. Um, it's a condition of the grant that we won't, they won't actually write us a check until we complete this. But yes, it makes us eligible for other grants. There there aren't a lot of cemetery grants out there. There's there's the right. historical commission, Mass Historic Commission, and there used to be a state parks grant for cemeteries. It doesn't exist anymore, but it could again. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Bidwell. So, so what would be permitted and what would not be permitted uh, within, the, within the cemetery itself? Re re replacement of, you know, repair and maintenance and replacement <coughs> of grave markers would be permitted? Yeah. Anything that's consistent with a cemetery, anything you can imagine being a cemetery yeah. is allowed. The city may or may not want to allow it, but um, it would be allowed this, the preservation restriction. What wouldn't be allowed would be disinterring group bodies and moving them elsewhere and developing into something different. Um, so any cemetery use, whether we're doing them now or not, it would be permitted. And then the graves themselves that we're spending money on, both CPA money right. and Mass Historic, those we have to. But if the city wanted to put up interpretive signage with it, within, it, all, 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 all that's mm -hmm. not going to be any impediments to anything like that's that. That's correct. Any other? I'm hearing none. All in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Excellent. So now it's time to spend some serious money. <laughs> Uh, this is 19084, in order to approve the 2020 general fund budget. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that the sum of $94,706,462, uh, <coughs> which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2020 general fund budget, which is July 1, 19 to June 30, 2020, be appropriated for the purposes stated, provided that the appropriations for Smith Vocational and Agricultural School shall be solely for the purposes of meeting net school spending as defined by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. No funds so appropriated shall be transferred to any other account or expended for any other purpose that would not be included in the calculation of net school spending. To meet this appropriation, um, one million. $857,164 will be raised and appropriated from the parking meter receipts reserved, $935,319 from the sewer enterprise funds, $620,420 from the water enterprise funds, $104,721 from the solid waste enterprise funds, $200,000. $80,008 from the Stormwater Enterprise Funds, $15,776 from the Community Preservation Act Administrative Funds, $23,306 from the Reserve for Police Station Debt Service, $775,874 from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund, and uh, $90 million 
93 do, 93 <laughs> $90,093,874 we raised and appropriated. Do we have a motion to finance? A motion. Second. Second. Um, we've talked about this for a while. Any other questions for the mayor on this? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> right, now we have some enterprise, enterprise funds. This is 19085 in order to approve the FY 2020 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget. Order that the sum of $6,490,000, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2020 Sewer Enterprise budget from July 1, 19 to June 30, 2020, be appropriated for the purposes stated to meet said appropriation. Um, $5,555,681 is to be raised from the sewer receipts, and 935319 shall be allocated to indirect costs. Do we have a motion finance? The motion. Second? Second. Any question on this one for the mayor? Hearing none, all in favor of positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the next is 19086 in order to approve uh, FY 2020 Water Enterprise Fund budget. Order that the sum of $7,280,000, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2020 Water Enterprise Fund budget, uh, July 1 to June, July 1, whoops, we got this one. This one is not correct. Uh, July 1, it says July 1, 18 to June 30, 19. So we're going to need to correct that on, on on my copy that's what it says yeah it's uh, we it's not correct here but it should be july july <laughs> july 1 20 uh, or 19 to june 30 20 the appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation six million six hundred and fifty nine thousand five hundred and eighty dollars is to be raised from water receipts and six hundred and twenty thousand four hundred and twenty shall be allocated to indirect costs. So again, this is fiscal year twenty twenty running from July one nineteen to June thirty, twenty twenty. Do we have a motion to finance? A motion. Uh, With the error corrected. Right. Second? Second. Any discussion on this one? All in favor, please say aye. All right, um, and then 19087, an order to approve the FY 2020 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget order that the sum of $602,659, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2020 Solid Waste Enterprise budget, July 1, 19 to June 30, 2020, be appropriated. The purpose is stated and to meet said appropriation, $376,279 is to be raised from solid waste receipts and $104,721 should be allocated to indirect costs and $121,659 shall be made available uh, from retained earnings balance of the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And the next is 19088, in order to approve the FY 2020 Stormwater and Flood Control Enterprise Fund budget, order that the sum of $1,996,486, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2020 Stormwater <coughs> Flood Control Enterprise Fund budget from July 1, 19 to June 30, 2020, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation, $1,706,000 thousand four hundred and eighty seven dollars is to be raised from the stormwater flood control receipts and two hundred and eighty thousand eight dollars shall be allocated to indirect costs do we have a motion finance Make a motion second any discussion um all in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. any opposed okay uh, next is nineteen zero eight nine in order to approve the fy 2020 revolving funds Order that in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half, the city shall vote the limit, a limit on the total amounts that may be expended from each revolving fund established by Chapter 16 of the ordinances. And I'm going to read them off to you. These are revol all revolving funds. Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund, 150000 Hazmat Revolving Fund, 85000 DPW Public Works Construction Services Revolving Fund, 85000 Senior Services Transportation Revolving Fund, $100,000. Senior Services Activities Revolving Fund, $90,000. Senior Services Gift Shop 
gift shop revolving fund, $20,000. Senior Services Food Service Revolving Fund, $35,000. Senior Services Publications Revolving Fund, $35,000. Senior Trips and Travel Revolving Fund, $75,000. Athletic League Fee Revolving Fund, $200,000. JFK Family Aquatic Center Fund, $120,000. Northampton Public Schools Transportation Revolving Fund, $200,000. Smith Vocational High School Farm Revolving Fund, $100,000. Tourism Directional Sign Program Revolving Fund, $10,000. Public Health Nurse Nursing Program Revolving Fund, $30,000. James House Revolving Fund, $85,000. Sharps Disposal Program Revolving Fund, $15,000. Fire Alarm Monitoring Program Revolving Fund, $60,000. And DPW Reuse Committee Revolving Fund, $15,000. We have a motion finance? I have a question. So I'll move. We'll, you, can we move it and then we'll get the second? All right. A question for the mayor? Yes. Mayor, on Senior Services Gift Shop Revolving Fund, <clears throat> didn't they close the gift shop? Because I see it looks like a library in now in there. Yeah, the gift shop has closed. Um, I'll probably bring an order at some point to close this fund, but because the ordinances under the Municipal Modernization Act, they made us codify all these revolving funds oh. ordinances. Okay. So I just left the limit in there, but we're probably going to close this one. Thank you. That would take a separate ordinance that you'd have to go through the whole process of ordinances. So. Thank you. So any more questions on the uh, revolving funds? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, the next is 19090, an order to rescind borrowing authority. Uh, order that the City Council rescinds the following orders because such borrowing authority is no longer necessary. There are three of them. Order 18059, it's a $200,000 borrowing authority authorized under a loan approved on April 15, 2018 to expand the Parsons Brook Greenway with the purchase of parcels of land abutting Parsons Brook Greenway as the borrowing is no longer needed. Um, order 181134, uh, a $400,000 borrowing authority authorized under a loan order approved August 16, 2018 to create the Rocky Hill Greenway multi-use trails through Burt's Bog Greenway as a borrowing authority is no longer needed. And order 18181, $120,000 borrowing authority authorized under loan order approved November 1st, 2018 for the acquisition of 119 acres in the Mineral Hills area as that borrowing is no longer needed. Do we have a motion finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. These are the three orders that Mr. Fyden referred to from previous acquisition projects where we applied for grants and got you to give us borrowing authority and we didn't end up using the borrowing authority so we want to rescind it because even though it's not a real borrowing authority it does still count it hangs our, around so we got to uh, cancel our, you know, debt. so we want to get it off the books right, uh, counselor I'm not sure what the reference to is the three votes just means the three different the three orders. these three orders so no I've never seen that I mean do we need to actually take these as a group no those were the that's just a reference to the orders that you originally okay. passed yeah. I see. so the three um, votes is so, yeah, we there are just, three of them. so you're just right. rescinding these three orders Got it. Yeah. Um, we're just we're just identifying them by name so that they tie back to those orders yeah. um, and just and just the borrowing just the borrowing. It's a borrowing authority. Not the purchase. Yeah, because it never yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And our last one is 19092, in order to rescind unused borrowing authority for uh, Mass School Building Authority projects at the Bridge Street and Leeds School Roof projects order that the city council rescind the unused and unneeded borrowing capacity authorized for the following massachusetts school building authority projects bridge street elementary school roof and parapet project the order was dated march 16 2017 it authorized one million six hundred and forty one thousand nine hundred and one dollars for this project and only five hundred thousand was needed to be borrowed to provide for the city share of the project expenses and therefore the council rescinds one million one hundred and forty one thousand nine hundred one dollars of the borrowing authority and then leeds elementary school roof phase two project that order was March 16, 2017. It authorized $1,775,294 for this project. 
only 500,000 was needed to be borrowed and provide to provide the city's share of the project expenses and therefore the council rescinds one million two hundred and seventy five thousand two hundred and ninety four dollars of the borrowing authority we have a motion on Make these. a motion second. second any other questions for somewhat analogous to the other ones where we this is a grant program and, and so we city's full faith and credit out there um, and then we've got reimbursement for the msba projects from the state so we didn't have to use the full borrowing so we're rescinding the remaining uh, borrowing mm -hmm. work that we don't want to use. Any other uh, questions for the mayor on this? Hearing none, all in favor of positive recommendation of finance? Aye. All in favor of adjourning finance, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, first one is 19.081 in order to borrow money and authorize acquisition of 100 acres at Pine Grove Golf Course. Move to approve. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please, when you are ready. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay. Um, next is 19.082 in order to purchase 5.8 acres in the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway. Move And <coughs> seconded. Any further discussion on this order? No? Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay. The next one is 19.083. In order to convey a permanent historic preservation restriction for Bridge Street Cemetery, there's been a request for two readings. Move to approve. It's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? No. Nope. Roll call, please. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Just bend the rule. Second. Just been made. Just bend rules. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, second reading. Move to second reading. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, roll call when you're ready, Laura. Councilor Murphy. <coughs> yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Yes. That passes in second reading. Um, Next is 19.084 in order to approve the fiscal year 2020 general fund budget. Move to approve. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion on the budget? Councilor Dwight. Uh, just a comment. I mean, I, I think we all know that um, I think we, several of us have been, if not all of us, have been entreated to vote down a budget that does not reflect in order to somehow um, position ourselves to encourage an increased salary um, contract for the teachers at Northampton schools. And um, I just want to say that I, I'm going to vote to approve this because to vote down the general fund budget while this is in mediation, in point of fact, should be, the public should be aware, this is a mediation. If the settlement comes out that there is more money that's required, the mayor will come and ask us for permission to allow, uh, allocate that money based on the agreement. We should not be involved because I have enormous respect for labor and labor um, governance and the labor process, which includes collective bargaining. And we pervert that if we interfere in any way. At the same time, I mean, I, I because we're not privy to uh, the levels of negotiations, the the, the pressures and the and the and the and the conflicts, and it'd be really inappropriate for us to actually jeopardize the entire budget just to make a demonstration. That's not, that is not a mature or responsible way to do um, fiscal oversight. So, in that regard, I will be. Voting in favor of this budget. 
comments. I agree. Any other comments on? Yes, Councillor Bidwell. Uh, I I agree with that also, and um, like all my colleagues, we've received literally hundreds of emails and a few phone calls and a few postcards and letters. And my response is that there's just besides it not being our place to step in and it being totally inappropriate to interfere in any way with collective bargaining, I would not presume uh, to be in position to substitute my judgment for the judgment of the school committee, the superintendent, and the mayor who have been involved at a tremendous level of detail in, in all of this. Uh, and it really is only one, one option for us as a, as a city council and that is to uh, approve the budget and be prepared for a uh, budget adjustment if necessary down the road. Councilor Kearney. Um, just a point of clarification, I guess. So uh, we're familiar with the um, section 7-4B in the charter. Um, I think we've got some communications around that, but uh, I'll just read this one sentence. It does say under adoption of the budget, the City Council shall adopt the proposed operating budget, which may have amendments within 45 days following the date the proposed budget is filed with the City Clerk. So I don't understand, I, I, I mean, it's been my understanding reading this that voting down the budget is not even an option. Mm -hmm. That what we can only do are make amendments to the budget in the form of deletions mm -hmm. and that we don't if we, if we do vote, if we don't adopt the proposed, and I don't even, see I don't, it says that the council <coughs> shall adopt the budget. So I don't understand that we even have the option to, um, to vote, I mean, I suppose we can vote, but it sounds to me like we're required to adopt it unless um, we delayed. So maybe as a point of clarification, that could be, and maybe to the president, <laughs> or to the vice president right here, or, or the mayor, or someone who could just clarify that. The city solicitor has opined on this. Yes, uh, yes. he has. And, and I think he essentially <clears throat> said that um, he interprets it the same way you do, that okay. we have to have a budget in place by July 1st. So you could definitely, you could ignore the budget as a form of protest and right. not take any action on it but then the charter and mass general law says the budget would then go into effect. Right, um, right. we can't operate without the budget. <clears throat> um, the council has the authority to cut it, and um, but council shall approve sounds pretty clear to me. Well, that's the way I read it. So, yeah. but, so should there, I, hypothetically, should this body by majority um, vote down the budget, for example, um, the next step would just be that it would be adopted after that after particular so time days. frame. Mm -hmm. It would be adopted as presented. Uh, I believe that would be the situation yes. most likely. Okay, yes. Because, <laughs> once actually oddly enough, because of Mass General Law, we have to have a budget. We, need, we are required by law to have a budget. State, not so much. When, when and if, you know, at their pleasure, when, when they get to it. We are required to. Um, I'm sure it's because if we dragged our feet, well, there are obvious reasons why you actually have to have a budget. But um, the fact is we can amend. We do. There are mechanisms by which we could actually, um, that we can employ, and they have been employed in the past uh, by previous councilors under the old charter, uh, uh, particularly one councilor going after a particular <coughs> department delete um, delete the funding for the salaries thereby throttling the department of course that council didn't get a majority vote that didn't pass but that is something we could do we could functionally it's it's a roundabout way it is in in this case we can't say that we want this department to have more money we can simply say if we voted in toto to cut a department we could do that and the mayor would have to actually uh, make accommodations for that and and there are counterpoints to it. <coughs> the mayor can come back. There are, it's, and this is the part that's confusing to me, and I think that it's kind of what you're asking as well. I mean, to what's the end game and what's the final product and what is the ultimate authority over, um, over the budget? So, and 
something I continue to ask, and and, and the state's not very forthcoming <laughs> as far as a clear and decisive response. From my, from my perspective, and certainly the finance director and probably the city auditor, you know, we have to meet payroll on July 1st. I mean, you think about you the have legal shut, yeah. think about the federal government shutdown. If you don't have a budget, you can't pay people, which is why they have to be furloughed and, and contract obligations can't get met. So that's the reason why we have to have a budget in place. So, um, so I don't know. I don't know that ever. I don't know that it's ever been in the history that a, a council just said we reject the budget. Um, right. That's why. Yeah. That's why I brought that up. And, and so because the orders are presented in a way that it's not an. It's it's you're voting to make those appropriations. You know that that you're, you're, you know it's you're voting to raise the that those monies and appropriate those monies, which is what forms the budget. Um, so that's where you would you would. Um, reduce it um, but again I, I guess you could reject it I just I'm not quite sure I wasn't looking to reject no, it. I understood I that yeah no, I, I just yeah. the only reason I brought it up is just really for clarification for people who might be watching totally understood that yeah. um, that what we have in our authority is to line item delete as mm -hmm. far as I understand it and I'm not inclined to make any deletions to the budget I just wanted it to be clear understood. what our options were as a council understood Thank you. yeah um, I'll just note, I'm not sure this is going to be at all clarifying, but um, it's not just our charter that determines what we can do. Mass General Law stipulates that we can only reduce, except there's one exception, which is that, and it's around a school budget, but that's only if the mayor puts forward a budget that is um, lower than the budget that was submitted by the school committee, which in our case, the mayor is the chair of the school committee. That would be very unusual. And we know that this budget is actually significantly higher than the budget that was voted on by the school committee. So that wouldn't uh, pertain in this case. But uh, okay. that's the only my other opinion. thing I would add to that is that you also, the city would have had to have accepted a certain sta a section of Mass General Law, oh, okay. which our city has not accepted. So that's like an added wrinkle. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Thank yeah, you for so that. That's another. Um, uh, Councillor, this is still to this point? To because this I point, know that yeah. there's some. Ha okay. It, it was to this point. It, it, it actually, the, our influence and, and oversight of the budget is ongoing in the budget process, with some, uh, with exceptions to the school committee, uh, the school budget, which is the mayor described is actually the, in this case, the school committee serves as the executive, and because it's such a significant portion of the budget relative to everything else. It's given that level of importance, the state acknowledges <coughs> that level of importance and gives it its own um, uh, representative oversight and that we don't have the authority to slap down. And, and that's always important to say that, that, this, that they're actually a separate legislative body but also a fiscal body that actually makes decisions. All other elements of the uh, budget, as we hear from department heads throughout the year, and as the budgets are proposed, and the mayor makes the budget proposals, the point that we can weigh in on how we think is appropriate. This goes to uh, Councilor Fidwell's suggestion that um, if it's possible to have a, maybe even earlier, more participatory conversations, and, and you know, it, it's. It's inelegant, but point in fact, actually, it's, it is fairly prescribed, and that, and I think that's been misunderstood by some of us and by the public. It's complicated, but the fact is, our our level of influence, particularly as it goes with the school budget, comes basically when we have our joint meeting, and that's basically when we get a budget presentation. We don't have the authority to change or dictate any terms there. It's just for purposes of us understanding. Yeah, you can lower the bottom line number of the school budget. Right, you right. can't go into the school right. budget and make cuts, like right. line item type sorts of cuts. Those that, that doesn't seem likely. That, like, and it's also, as, as far as making a <coughs> demonstration of sorts to levy negotiations seems kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face to actually cut school funding in order to try and increase school funding, not a really good way to go about things. There are hands over here. Yeah, That's only if this is done. I'm done. Okay. That was great, though, by the way. Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, I, earlier I thanked the mayor for his fine work around pulling this budget together. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to thank all of the city administrators for all the work they did. Their presentations indicated to me that they were, they really were thoughtful about the way they went through um, pulling together. <coughs> 
together the budgets for their departments. And I also especially want to uh, thank uh, Finance Director Wright for all of her fine work. Um, uh, I'm complimenting her now and look at her. She's she busy. She's working. I know. <laughs> but I, I just appreciate, you know, the mayor has, is, is especially competent in speaking to the city finances. But behind him is, is Finance Director Wright. And I, I, when she speaks, to, she follows these conversations and she can just get up and just, you know, like uh, Councilor Labarge's question earlier about uh, a, a, a fund and she knew exactly what it was. Yeah, and here's what we're gonna do. She always on top of things. And so uh, I wanna appreciate my thanks for that work. Anybody else? I'll just note that we always um, hope for and beg and plead for uh, public participation in this process. And we actually got it this year. I'm not really sure we deserve the credit for it. Um, but like all good politicians, let's take it. And be very glad that um, we had people come to our, to our budget hearings and, and, uh, and comment. That was really great to see people interested in the budget. So. Let's vote on it. Roll call, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Yes. That passes in first reading. Um, we're now moving on <coughs> to the enterprise funds. 19.085 in order to approve FY 2020 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget. Did we take the enterprise funds as a group? Yes. Do we need a motion to do that? Yeah. I'll, I'll You're going to uh, second I'll Second them as a group. I'm going to second his motion, which is what it sounded like to me. <laughs> That's what All those was. in favor <laughs> of taking them as a group. I move we take them as a group. <laughs> um, aye. Aye. That's all the enterprise funds. The enterprise funds. So Just the enterprise funds. So we're taking 19.085 in order to approve FY 2020's Sewer Enterprise Fund budget, 19.086 uh, in order to approve FY 2020 Water Enterprise Fund budget, 19.087 in order to approve FY 2020 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget, 19.088 uh, in order to approve FY 2020 Stormwater and Flood Control Enterprise Fund budget, um, but not the revolving funds? No, I do that nope. separately. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're taking those as a group. Any discussion on this group? Roll call, please. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Move approval. Motion's been, I mean, it's been, yeah, made, <laughs> seconded. Um, <clears throat> any discussion on the revolving funds? No? Um, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. And I would remove the, I would move the two rescinding borrowing authority items as a group. Second. Second. Um, motion has made and second to take those as a group. All those in favor of taking them as a group? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, so this is 19.090 in order to rescind borrowing authority. Three votes. It's three different orders uh, that we're rescinding. Order 18.059, order 18.1134, order 18.181. And 19.092 in order to rescind unused borrowing authority for MSBA projects Bridge Street and Leeds School Roofs. Any discussion on rescinding that borrowing? No? <coughs> Roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Carney. Yes. 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 Those all pass in first reading, um, except for the one that we did two readings for, which passed entirely. Moving on to financial orders on their second reading. 
we have 19.075 in order to authorize borrowing $15 million for electrical and process upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. Move second. Made and seconded. Any further discussion on this order? Councillor Nash. I just uh, I want to thank uh, the mayor for clarifying some things with me. I went through uh, the Kleinfelder study, which was the study that was set forth uh, to uh, outlining what we needed to do with our wastewater facility. And I noticed that what we were asking for wasn't quite lining up and that uh, the the, the reason for part, the, the differences were that there's changes in regulations that we're trying to keep up with. Uh, am I saying this correctly, Mayor? And that, uh, that um, so that was why things weren't lining up, and, um, but we're on track. We are, we're moving in the direction of, uh, the right direction to get everything up to compliance, so. Well, that is good news. <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> Roll call, please. Chancellor White. Yes. Chancellor Yes. Chancellor Yes. Chancellor Yes. Chancellor Yes. Okay. 19.077 in order to establish marijuana community impact fee stabilization fund. It's been made and seconded. Um, any discussion on the stabilization fund? Hearing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Blunt. Yes. Okay. Uh, order 19.078 In order to dedicate marijuana host community fees to marijuana community impact fee stabilization fund. No approval. Made and seconded. Any discussion on dedicating the fees to the fund? Hearing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Okay. We are. I just wanted to say I, I was going to, um, Ms. Wright is leaving. Um, what? Because <laughs> uh, we've completed the financial orders, but I did want to just recognize her. Um, she's had a long day. Yes. <laughs> she drove to Mount Wachusett's today. Wow. Um, um, and she was honored with a number of other people uh -huh. um, by the small uh, town administrators of Massachusetts um, for, uh, for her role as one of the first circuit riders. Uh, this was a program that started in 19, or, 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 I won't say the date, um, uh, but it was basically a, a, a state program to try to encourage um, more professional management and administration in small towns. Um, so Ms. Wright was actually assigned to the towns of Shelburne, Buckland, Colerain, and Heath up in Franklin County. Um, and that was from like 1985 to 1988. Um, and so the circuit rider program eventually went out of business because all these towns realized like, yeah, I guess we really do need like town administrator. So she was kind of like the shared circuit rider town administrator for those four towns, which one of them was my hometown. Um, weren't you in high school? Then? No, I, no I, was, <laughs> I, was, uh, I had actually graduated. I was okay. in the Air Force. Okay. So uh, yeah, I was a little older than that. Um, but anyway, so today the governor um, and the small t uh, small town or small uh, town administrators association brought together a group of those first circuit riders, which became now the small town administrators association, and they recognized them. So, uh, and that's why she was she's been doing a lot of driving today. But I wanted to publicly recognize her. Um, Thank you for that. So, Congratulations uh, on that. When you, when you run a small town, you have to be mindful of lots of details when you're an administrator. I think that's what makes her such a great administrator of our large operation because she started uh, in these small towns uh, where there's really, you know, there's one person basically who's doing everything. So anyway. So Congratulations. Congratulations. I hope you heard Councillor Nash's kind words too. Yes. You were very busy. You're an excellent multitasker. <laughs> All of us in our small city are really grateful to have you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Drive safely. A little ways to go yet. Okay. Um, we are on ordinances. 18.231.
an ordinance relative to large scale ground mounted solar arrays. This is the second reading of this ordinance, so I'm not going to read it. I'm sure you guys are not sad. Um, is there a motion on this one? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. It's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. yes. Councilor Yes. 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 I'd actually move we take the parking on Main Street, Florence, and Chestnut Street as a group. Second been made and seconded to take those two as a group. All those in favor of doing that? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, we're gonna take them as a group. So this is 19.039, an ordinance relative to parking on Main Street in Florence, and 19.052, an ordinance relative to parking on Chestnut Street. Um, oh, we need you know, an And I apologize, because I did second that, but I, I'm gonna recuse myself from one of the votes. Of uh, the the first that one actually gate your second <coughs> and I went and seconded moving them as a group so I <coughs> complicating matters and I realize I'm not helping speed things along. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> is there a motion to take these as a group? So moved. There's a legitimate second over there. Okay. All those in favor of taking them as a group? Aye. 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 No. A no or an abstention? I, well, I'm moving no not to take care. them as a group because I don't <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to stand on both. How's that? If one's a problem, the other is too. Right. <laughs> okay, they're, they are moved as a group. Um, is there a um, move approval? Thank you. There's, I need a second. Okay. Any discussion on either or both of these? No. Okay. Roll call, please. Yes. Um, yes. 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 Okay. That passes. Um, in second reading. So this is 19.054, an ordinance allowing marijuana testing and processing in core business districts. I, this I, is a first reading. I would actually, well, I'm going to float this. I would like to move the marijuana ones as a group. I would, I would second. second that. Mm -hmm. And that's up to item 19.058. Um, okay. That's, that's what it would be. Yeah. Which is like H, yeah. I think. Uh, D E F. Yeah. Mm -hmm. G H. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all those in favor of taking those as groups, say aye. 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 Okay, we're going to take them as a group, but I'm going to read them because it's a first reading. I, oh, it's I, first reading. No. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah, <laughs> no, you should read them. <laughs> okay. I mean, you we, you could waive reading. I'm sorry, I'm speaking out of turn. You could waive read, um, and and just have uh, the planning director present them. If, if, I mean, we can waive the reading, but for the public record, these are in the public record, but also the video counts as a public record as well. So I don't know. It's entirely up to the the committee. Um, what is the committee's pleasure? I'll move we waive reading. Second. All those in favor of waiving reading? Aye. 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 Okay. We've waived. Reading's been waived. I, I actually abstain. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One I'm abstention jerk. on waiving yes. reading. What? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so I think yeah. Director uh, Fiden and I will kind of tag team a little bit on this. Great. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, one of the key components of the ordinances you have is um, uh, when we first presented our zoning for uh, uh, adult use marijuana, uh, we kind of broadly used manufacturing, um, which captures all different elements of um, uh, you know, cultivation, um, processing, and it also swept up into it um, testing labs. Um, and so we want to come back now and uh, revisit that 
uh, because we realized that that basically said that testing labs could only be in industrial areas and could only be um, in, in you know, those sorts of areas. So um, this is an effort to try to go back because the testing labs are a much less intensive. Um, you know, it's a laboratory setting. It's, uh, I think, believe you had some testimony at your committee from an actual scientist about what sort of processes goes on there. Um, I didn't mind, but maybe a legislative uh, matters. I think legislative matters okay. that. Um, and so we, um, because we want to, uh, you know, we believe that we need to have testing labs to support this industry, and we have had inquiries from testing labs um, who are somewhat limited by our current zoning. This is an effort to, um, to allow them to be in areas. And it's not just marijuana testing labs, it's for other sorts of testing labs. Um, so anyway, that's the background on that one. And so this just basically allows them in the, um, in the core business districts as well as in the PB district. So those are those two changes. Um, the next piece um, is about the filtration, which uh, uh, we've heard some public discussion about, and I said that we had been working on an ordinance. This just clarifies um, the filtration requirements that we expect in, um, in manufacturing uh, and cultivation facilities, which is sort of based on the kind of the, right now, the kind of best practice around it, um, but it does allow for the possibility of a change in technology. Um, and then the final one is about outdoor growing. Um, and on this one, I think I'm going to let uh, Director Fiden speak to this one. Um, it was, again, an attempt to go back um, as we saw how this actually played out. Um, and the fact it actually, even though it's outdoor growing, there's a lot of you know, restrictions around security. There's actually a requirement that you build a building, like you have to build a building, even though it's you know, outdoor cultivation. So there are some of those things that I think when we wrote the first ordinance were not as anticipated. And then also there's people, um, there's different interpretations of outdoor cultivation and um, some discussion from some potential applicants about wanting to build pretty permanent structures, which kind of turns them into a greenhouse pretending to be outdoor. So we wanted to really clarify that as well. So that's kind of what that's about. Um, I'll, I'll let Director Fine get more into the Although I'm not going to say <laughs> the mayor basically said everything I had to say. You can't talk about this topic. No, you can't talk about this topic without. Uh, yes. So I, I think of all the marijuana uses, at least so far, it's the outdoor growing that's been most controversial, although we've had nothing that's actually advanced. Um, this is setting a list. So this is not about the use. That may or may not be something we want to revisit in the future, but right now, outdoor growing is allowing, uh, is allowed. So this is really setting a use about the buildings. The city solicitor feels that in allowing um, outdoor growing, we have to allow the buildings, so we want to reasonably regulate them. And so this says no more than a thousand square feet. It doesn't really get to be a greenhouse. It doesn't really get to be a making candy. It's really just the basic things you can wash your product and wash your hands and those kinds of things. So it is more restrictive than the current rules, probably not as much more restrictive as some people would like, but it's a, a step for dealing with what's been the most controversial part. As you noted, this. Um, this went to community resources, and we had long discussion and made some amendments, and then there was a joint hearing, planning board and legislative matters. Were you about to report out on that? No, because I wasn't there. Uh -huh. I was not in attendance. It was extensive. Yes. And yeah. informative. Excellent. Was a long well, mine was simply important information. Um, in addition to all these ordinances, there is required by law a host agreement with each each applicant. So that there, there are many bites of the apple of each of these projects, including the planning project pro, uh, uh, process as well. So um, I, I appreciate this, these rules, so they give more brighter lines for right. within where someone can function. But at the same time, I think um, we should also be comforted by the fact that there are multiple opportunities for the public to participate in this and also offer submit their approval or disapproval of this agreement. That's a good well. I would, I would just add that when we had our extensive discussion of community resources, we acknowledged that uh, this probably is not the last time we'll be seeing these, these matters, that it's, that it's an evolving, uh, an evolving field, the regulation of the field is evolving, everybody's learning as we're going along, including the Cannabis Control Commission. 
and uh, this is our best attempt at regulating based on what we know now and it'll likely change sometime down the road any other questions or discussion on this group of ordinances no okay so roll call please Laura on these one two three four five six ordinances. yes 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 Yes. Yes, there are only five. Sorry. Five. five. I miscounted. But yes. Um, <clears throat> okay, those all pass in first reading. And we are on to 19.062, an ordinance to amend uh, Chapter 5 of the Code of Ordinances by amending Section 5 7, Special Municipal Employees. This Ooh. is a second reading. Move approval. Second. It's been made and seconded. Any further discussion on this ordinance? Hearing none, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay, <coughs> we are on to a bunch of short-term rental zoning <coughs> ordinances which i would move as a group that may Second. be nice <laughs> Second. that's been made yeah. seconded all in favor of moving these as a group aye aye okay so and wave reading with the why what time is it <laughs> move we adjourn <laughs> <laughs> careful don't say that it's a non-debatable uh, <laughs> no yeah, don't go there yeah. <laughs> Um, there was a motion it's to waive wave reading. reading. It's been seconded. All those in favor of waiving reading of these? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're going to waive reading of these. I but abstain. Councilor Dwight is going to abstain. From, from the waiving of the reading. From waiving the reading. Um, <laughs> this is what I'm not going to read, but I'm going to tell you what they are. 19.068, an ordinance to amend zoning to add definitions of short-term rental and owner-occupied dwellings. 19.069, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in WSP, SC, SR, and RR districts. 19.070, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in URA and URB districts. 19.071, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the URC district. 19.072, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in GB and NB districts. 19.073, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the CB, EB, HB, and OI districts. And uh, 19.074, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow bed and breakfast and short-term rentals in the PV district. Any discussion? Uh, Wayne, would you like to tell us about all of those? Sure, I'll just give you a very brief version. So obviously you acted tonight on tr how trust fund money gets spent from, from short-term rentals. Um, there's, for the most part, we see short-term rentals as being great for the city in terms of bringing in business and tourism um, and, and bringing a supplemental income for property owners. There are two potential concerns. Um, many cities are much more resorty than, than we are, um, have lost a lot of rental units affordable as, as units convert that's probably not a risk here but it's certainly a potential issue and then many neighborhoods or some neighborhoods worry about the amount of traffic that comes in we think on the whole that they're a good thing and so the proposal here is basically allowing short-term rentals in all neighborhoods basically all places where we allow residential but requiring registration um, the point of registration is not so much frankly the registration it's to prevent grandfathering because if we allow short-term rentals just now everywhere, and then two years from now, council says, oh, this is horrible, everybody who's had one is grandfathered. Um, in allowing registration, it basically means you're only guaranteed your ability to have this rental for a year, and then if a year from now, council wants to come back and say, hey, it's not working, we're getting too many of these, we want to have different regulations in the district, then the uses, once the registration runs out, wouldn't be grandfathered. So it's really a test. It's a go slow, almost certainly just like 
marijuana, we will be come back before you in a year or two or three, whether it's to liberalize or not liberalize, we'll be up to all of you. We should note that this also had went to a joint public hearing for planning and uh, legislative matters. Which is very informative. Also very informative. Excellent. Any further questions or comment on this group? No? Okay, roll call, please. I just have to clarify. Yes. This group, you took a voice vote to act on them as a group. Is a separate motion needed to approve it as a group? Yeah. There was one. There. Council Murphy moved them as a group. It was seconded, and then there was a motion to waive reading that was seconded and voted on as well. So, is that motion that is it on? Move, is do we ever put it on the floor? As a, like, or do we have to move the whole group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's on the floor. And so let's go with that. Worth, right, second. Second. <laughs> He just moved. So I think the question is whether it's enough that we say, I, I think what you're suggesting, Laura, is that we have to do right. two things. We have to first say we're going to take them as a group, and Thank then again, move approval as a group. Yes. It have yes. to be two yes. motions. Yes. Right. And so I, I think, well, what we have been doing is two motions for all the first. We would move them as a group, and then we'd move approval. So we, that, we might as well. No, but we didn't. We only moved to take them as a group. I'm sorry. We voted both. I'm pretty sure we voted. We voted to put it on the floor, and then also vote. Okay, we'll, we'll prepare. Now we'll do it again. let's vote to <coughs> move them as a group. We've moved them. They're moved. We're and going then we, to and then we waived the reading, now. so we're we waved. Roll call. Yes, Which roll call. But better safe than sorry. Eight. So Eight. I seconded. Councilor Dwight. <laughs> yes. Up near. I put it away. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. And this is when you guys are really, th those were approved. Um, this is where you guys really hate me because it feels like the end, but. We have something. The bulk of the agenda we still have in front of us. Um, first, what we're going to do is actually move, uh, go back to what was number five, which is updates from the council president and committee chairs. There is a letter from um, our council president. He's clearly thinking about us, even though he's not here. Um, honorable members, this is dated June 6, 2019. Honorable members of the city council in accordance with R19.012. Um, a resolution establishing a select committee on pesticide reduction as amended by R19.047 and section 2.6.2 three of the council rules, I'm appointing the following people to the select committee on pesticide reduction. One, Councillor Elisa Klein. Two, Councillor James Nash. Three, Adele Franks. Four, Kate Simmons. Five, Cynthia Swopis. Um, and sorry, I should have said Councillor Klein is Ward 7. Councillor Nash is Ward 3. Adele Franks is 123 Black Birch Trail. Kate Simmons, 11 Wilder Place. Cynthia Swopis, uh, 120 Coles Manor Road. Although the council's resolution authorized me to appoint up to 10 members, I've chosen to constitute the committee at a smaller size, and I believe we will ultimately be, uh, that I believe will ultimately be more manageable and effective. I fully expect the committee will be able to rely on other outside advisors as they conduct their study, hold hearings, and receive testimony. As best as I could, I've tried to make appointments consistent with the resolution's goal that appointees possess, quote, expertise in the professional fields of agriculture, recreation, forestry, turf management, organic and or IPM land care, conservation, public health, or other related fields, or who are representatives from the public schools, end quote. To help the members of the committee understand the requirements of serving as a member of a public body, the city solicitor has graciously agreed to appear at the committee's initial meeting to provide an overview and answer questions. Of course, even for their first meeting, members will collectively be a public body and should not hold discussions among a majority of members outside of public session. Lastly, please note that as provided by Council Rule 2.6.3, the appointee I first announced in this letter, namely Councillor Klein, will serve as temporary chair until the committee elects a chair. I thank all members of this committee for their willingness to serve, and I look forward to their efforts. Sincerely, Ryan O'Donnell. Um, and it's, it's worth noting we just authorized them special membership status. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is read an announcement regarding executive session minutes. The Open Meeting Law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 22, requires public bodies to regularly review minutes of executive session to determine if they may be disclosed. The executive session minutes of November 16th, 2017, February 21st, 2019, and March 21st, 2019 have been reviewed. It has been determined that, because of pending legal action and on ongoing contract negotiations, disclosure would defeat the lawful purpose of the executive sessions, so continued non-disclosure is warranted. We are now moving to the back to the consent agenda. <clears throat> okay. Um, do I read it first? Let's track. Yeah, you. And then you, you you can ask for a motion after you read what the items are. May I suggest two? Uh, uh, one thing about all these appointments is they all are for the same term from mm -hmm. July 2019 to June 2022. Um, so that might just save some. Oh, we don't have to three read minutes, that 37 yeah. times. <laughs> okay. Thank you for noting that. Okay, first up 19.040 um, appointments on the Council of Aging. Um, the, this is, uh, Robert Dion of 87 Vernon. Excuse me, Sorry, the, yeah. the minutes, we have to do the, yeah. Where are they? Oh, I missed them. Yeah. They're up here. Okay. Um, minutes of May 16, 20, May 16, 2019. First, then B, it's 19 point. So this is uh, Council on Aging, Robert Dion, 87 Vernon Street, Northampton. Um, as Counselor... Carney noted the term for all of these is April 2019. Except this one, I don't know. Except, this <laughs> only, the except one. only this one. Uh, the term for Robert Dion is April 2019 to June 2021 to fulfill the unexpired term of Jean Petty. Uh, next is the housing. And the, yeah, the, the next batch. There <laughs> Forget um, it. Housing <laughs> partnership. Uh, this is Carmen Juno, 73 Straw Avenue in Florence. Uh, the corrected term is March 2019 to June 2022. Moving, okay, we already did an C, which was the business owner's permit. Moving to D, 19.065 appointments to various committees, all positive recommendations. Um, I'm not going to read the removals because they've been removed. Uh, so first up, this is for the Arts Council. Courtney Hummel, 320 Elm Street in Northampton, July 2019 to June 2022. It's a reappointment. Next is board of, to the Board of Assessors. Denny Nolan, 319 Elm Street. Um, these all seem to be July 2019 to June 2022. Next is Board of Health. Joanne Levin, 40 Columbus Avenue. Reappointment. Uh, Council on Aging. Donna Park, 205 Prospect Street reappointment. Um, da, 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 da. Moving down to the Still Council on Aging, Benjamin Capstrand, 48 High Street reappointment. Now we're at the Community Preservation Committee, Brian Adams, 36 Arlington Street uh, reappointment, Conservation Commission, C. Mason Marone, 18 Ellington Road uh, reappointment. Randy Krotowski, 171 Emerson Way. It's a reappointment. Disability Commission, Emma Cornwell, um, 35 Holyoke Street. Reappointment. Now this is a his the Historical Commission. Martha Lyon, 313 Elm Street. Reappointment. Craig De La Pena, 62 Chestnut Street. It's a reappointment. Housing Partnership. Tess Perone Poe, 32 Masonic Street. Uh, this is... This is to the housing partnership, and it's to fill a vacancy as representative from the planning board. Um, the Human, Human Rights Commission, Karen Bell Vance Grace, 19 Church Street. It's a reappointment. Moving on to Parks and Rec Committee, Thomas Dumphy, 6 Chesterfield Road in Leeds. That is a reappointment. David Cronin, 103 Pioneer Knowles Extension. Uh, that is also a reappointment. Planning board, um, which is Harry Cole Hayne. There was something there. Uh, withdrawn. And that's the one. I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we are not going to read that. It's been withdrawn. Uh, Christopher Granat, 492 Elm Street. That's a reappointment. Zoning Board of Appeals, Elizabeth Silver, 67 Willow Street. Reappointment. Sarah Northrop, 147 Hinckley Street. That's a reappointment. 
Now we're moving on to another bunch. Um, also all with positive recommendations from city services. Community Preservation Committee, Linda Morley, 244 Prospect Street, reappointment, Patrick Bowen, this is Housing Partnership, Patrick Bowen, 95 Straw Avenue, reappointment, Alexander Jarrett, 8 High Street, reappointment, Gordon Shaw, 582 Haydenville Road, reappointment, Planning Board, Tess Prone Poe, 32 Masonic Street, number 4, reappointment. Now we're on to the Whiting Street Fund Committee, Michael Quinlan, 712 Bridge Road, a reappointment now uh, these next batch are to be referred to city services arts council <coughs> danielle almadeo 50 union street number 13 to fill the unexpired term of dara herman zerling uh, conservation commission jason perry 14 carolyn street this is a reappointment. Disability Commission, Judith Kimberly, 693 Park Hill Road, reappointment. Jean Page, 46 Evergreen Road, number 107, reappointment. Chris Plamis, 659 Park Hill Road, reappointment. Human Rights Commission, Jeremy Whalen, 31 Union Street, it's a reappointment. Public Shade Tree Commission, Marilyn Castriota, uh, reappointment. And uh, so those are all of those that are being referred to city services. Next up, we have a petition for an, the annual secondhand dealer licenses. Renewal license for Electric Eye Records, 52 Main Street, number 6. Petitioner Andrew Crespo and Ryan's Jewelers, 14 Strong Avenue. Petitioner John Malakowski. Um, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. And made and seconded. No discussion on the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Can we recess for finance <laughs> committee? <laughs> so, <laughs> did we get it all, everybody? You slammed it. I would like to move to adjourn. Second. Second. Very much. No discussion on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody.